And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed Reacts. Today, we're going to be covering DB Cooper, man. This one's going to be lit. Let's get into it. A special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. Fred Jeffrey Williams, an associate of YSL, did commit the felony. Oh, here's what 6 9 actually got. Racketeer conspiracy. This attack shifted the whole U.S. government. This guy got arrested. Espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russian Zodiac killer is a pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who operated in Northern California. All these serial killers got um, Samuel Little, etc. They really get off on getting attention from the media. Here, Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploited and abused dozens of minor girls. It was OJ working together to get Nicole killed. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. And we are back. What's up, guys? Welcome uh, to Fed It. Um, actually, sorry, Fed Reacts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, Angie in the house. I mean, Angie, you want to um, introduce yourself real quick and give some quick updates? Hi, guys. Um, updates? Well, I still have like a long list of cases that you have been requesting. Uh, I'm going to pay more attention to the Super Chats. So if you guys like request on the Super Chats, I'll be writing down your your cases your request uh if not you can go to at fed reacts on instagram uh we're posting more more stuff there and we're being active there so you guys can like request on my on the dms i'll be reading you all and yeah that's it boom all right and uh, i know some of you guys are probably wondering where's kim uh she's uh she's out of the country right now with her mom she went out she went with her mom uh traveled so um she'll be back i think tomorrow so you guys will see her on fresh and fit uh, but I got Angie here helping me. Um, shout out to her. She came just came from work and she's helping out. Um, what else? New intro, as you guys can see here. Uh, I'm going to still tweak it a little bit. Um, we sh I want to make it a little bit, maybe a tad bit longer and add a few more things. But other than that, it's not going to be, you know, like two minutes like the last one. So don't worry. Um, what else? Uh, we got a couple cases in the, in the list that we still got to hit. Um, I'm probably going to do an episode for you guys on the mafia that covers all the families all across the United States. Because I know we covered the five crime families in New York. Then we covered the outfit out of Chicago, Al Capone. And then we're going to go ahead and cover uh, the Traficantes down in um, Florida. A couple of the guys out of California, Vegas. Um, I think there was a, uh, one out of the Cincinnati, etc. So we're going to cover all those ones that we didn't miss originally. And then I'm probably going to do one more episode with Ryan Dawson where we're going to cover how the mafia was intimately tied with intelligence agencies such as the CIA, et cetera. Um, and that will eventually tie into John F. Kennedy later on when we do the JFK show. Um, and then also uh, serial killers that we got on the list. I, I got the torso killer on. Uh, Angie, can you think of any other ones that they asked uh, for? Ed Gain. Oh, we already did him, though. Oh, sorry, Ed Kemper. Yeah, oh, Ed me. Kemper. Okay, yeah, all right. Ed Kemper, um, yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, the brothers, those Melendez uh, yeah, brothers. Yeah, the Menendez brothers. Um, I want to do Aileen Wernus. Oh, yes. Aileen Wernus, yes. We still have to do her too. The only yeah. female serial killer. And then anything else? Uh, there are, are plenty. There are plenty. I can name like a bunch right now, but okay. I don't know if you want me to name them all because it's a, it's a bunch of people asking, you know. Yeah. Um, loads of cases. Hang on. Yeah, so we'll make sure we get those for you guys. Uh, but I think we got probably two more episodes of the Mafia, and then the Mafia will be done. And then we will go ahead and also do uh, the Colombian cartel and the Miami uh, you know, connection from the 1980s with Pablo Escobar, etc. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, Kim has quite a bit of knowledge on that because I think it was her mom's friend dated one of Pablo Escobar's workers or something like that. So she has quite a bit of knowledge. She's been to the, the mansion before, the old mansion. It's run down now. Um, but she's from Medellin as well. So she has a lot of insider knowledge on that organization and a lot of, um, I guess, uh, links. She's probably a drug trafficker herself, who knows? But anyway, <laughs> but yeah, she'll be helping with the Pablo Escobar stuff uh, quite a bit because she is Colombian and she's from that part of Colombia. So uh, definitely we will cover that. You guys have been asking me for Pablo Escobar forever, uh, and I'll also be covering um, – Chapo probably after that, right? We're going to try to do it in chronological order. We're going to hit the 80s first with the Colombians and the cocaine in Miami, you know, Griselda Blanco, all that stuff. We'll probably cover all that because it's all tied in together. And then we're going to go into the Me Mexican side with uh, Chapo Guzman. Then we'll go into the Chapo. Zetas, etc. So don't worry. We'll cover all that. Um, what else here? Uh, I guess we can hit some of these chats before we get into it. Um, okay. Let's see here. Let me pop them up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and thank you guys so much for the, for the support. I really appreciate it. Uh, we got here 
Mitchaka goes, Baron, life hack when buying a property first identifies them boys and you'll automatically get accepted. Chris is a bum with Mo with four wives, W. Ryan. Yeah, I, that's a fact, bro. I've, I've lost a bunch of properties to them boys, if you guys know what I'm saying. The fucking, uh, who else? Uh, we got here Michael Mistroke, $1. Appreciate that greatly, sir. Uh, Jose Rubio going, when we get into Stephen Avery case? Stephen Avery, that name's I don't, I don't, I don't have that one. Let me just write it down. I should write it down. Actually, I have it right here. <laughs> oh, she did. Who, I'm trying to remember who that <laughs> is. That, that, that name sounds very familiar. Uh, uh, you can look it up right okay. over here. We hear, yeah, pull it up on your side, Angie. Uh, we got here. Sexy Tom goes. Will you ever do Shoko Asahara, a founder of Um Shin Rikoyo cult? He was convicted of masterminding the what? deadly 1995 sarin gas attack on a Tokyo subway. I try to stay away from foreign criminals, guys. Uh, uh, you know, you guys uh, been asking a lot of like the yakuza, yeah, mob and stuff. And when I say foreign criminals, I mean operating in foreign countries. I don't like if it's Ameri like if it's triads and yakuza that are operating in the United States. That's one thing, but foreign criminals i try to stay away from it because i'm not too well versed in their laws um but i will um, cover it if like you know there's enough asked for but that's the first time i've had asked uh, gotten that request um the steven avery is a baseball player but i don't know what happened to him baseball player yeah it's he's from the cincinnati reds he worked for atlanta braves boston red sox and the detroit are you sure Tigers. that's the same steven avery they're asking for i guess he is because yeah. He's probably a killer or a criminal of some kind of they're asking for that. I don't know. All right. I'll keep going here uh, while she does that. Um, we got here. Three Diglets goes. It's Sunday. You know what that means. Fed is Sunday is now. Fed reacts Sunday. 200K on the way. Let's go. Appreciate that, my friend. Harper Thompson goes, will you ever do Jesse Smollett? He was convicted. Uh, what, the guy that lied about racism? Uh, maybe. Myron, will you ever do the Sinaloa's cartel highest ranking hitman, El Chino Anthrax and Trax? By the way, we need Wes Watson on FNF. Don't worry, Wes Watson is coming uh, in June, guys. We got him locked in uh, for one of the Money Mondays. And then as far as uh, Sinaloa's, I will do that. Don't worry. Remember to announce the live show and Michael Francis and everything. Uh, oh, yeah, we did that last last week, last Thursday. Oh, no, but that, he's going to come back um, in July. He's yeah. going to come back in July. He's got an event with... With Mike Tyson. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, and I will be there too, guys, July 22nd. 22-year-old trucker from Hartford, uh, Connecticut, 700 credit score. Blessed to know we are from the same state. Yeah, shout out to Hartford, man. 10 miles up the road uh, from New Britain. Uh, please do Wars Cartel with uh, El Senor Juarez. de los Cielos. Okay, we will definitely will be doing that. We're going to be covering Mexican drug trafficking quite a bit. Uh, you don't understand how clutch you and Angie been for me. There's been several nights where I stayed up till 4 a.m. just watching the videos. Jody Ares, DC Snipers, Casey Anthony, and many more. I fuck with y'all. Thank you, Amir. I appreciate that greatly, man. We uh, try to give you all this sauce, man. Uh, it's not just debating women all the time we're trying to give you guys some true crime knowledge as well uh when is the next call and show i want a peaceful debate myron uh and that's from i don't play games uh if we got time my friend uh, and then this was the japanese one uh let me think we're caught up i think we're caught up yeah, yeah. and did we have the right stephen avery on that one no uh, the only thing that appears oh are... there we go making a murderer the netflix special that's what oh, it was. Oh, okay. The dude out in the Midwest. I knew it, that name sounded familiar. Okay. Okay. Making a murderer. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Um, okay, let me type <clears> that. So, yeah, guys, do me a quick favor. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We're definitely the most uh, uh, W. Myron flexible content. We got y'all, baby. We guys, we cover true crime. We cover serial killers, uh, terrorists, bank robberies. We've covered pretty much, man, everything. Financial crimes. Yeah, I have, I have bank Griselda free. Blanco as well yes we have her don't worry she's gonna come in when we do the colombians guys uh with pablo escobar and stuff like that which uh kim will be heavily involved in that so we're gonna cover the the colombians and we're gonna cover miami in the 1980s as well um but yeah guys we're, we're flexible over here man we don't just give you guys self-improvement concept but we also give you guys true crime stuff on all different types of crime right so uh make sure to subscribe to the yeah, channel if you haven't already this one? uh bro you should do something on the shower posse jamaican gang 1400 murders in the 80s uh okay i can i we still need to do um speaking of jamaican i might bring dollface back for the for that one with you guys um the guy that was a drug trafficker that got arrested by the dea i can't remember his name right now god damn it someone in the chat's gonna put it for me but it was a big drug trafficker out of jamaica um that the da went after uh like 10 years ago uh anything else here mm -hmm. uh hey Mara, kiki camarena next or you go into tie that with the mexican series i will tie that with the mexican series i actually met his family when i was an agent in laredo guys uh they came um, to Laredo to give uh, a speech. So yeah, rest in peace to him. 
I work at a gym and was watching you and a client said, I see you're watching FNF. You're a brother, huh? I love seeing gym bros unite. Absolutely, man. That's what it's about, bro. Um, and I think yes. that's that's it. We're, yeah, caught, we're up. caught up. Cool. All right, guys. So we're going to be covering. Um, no, it was a Vibes Cartel. I did Vibes Cartel already. There we go. Christopher Dudas Coke. That's who we're going to be covering um, for the drug trafficking as well. I have him on the list. I've had him on the list for a very long time. So that's going to come very soon. Uh, so, all right, guys. We're going to be covering D.B. Cooper today. D.B. Cooper, a uh, fucking legend, uh, by the way. Um, D.B. Cooper is a media uh, epithet for an unidentified man who hijacked Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727 aircraft in the United States airspace on November 24th, 1971, basically the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, during a flight from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington, the hijacker told a flight attendant he was armed with a bomb, demanded $200,000 in ransom, equivalent to $1.4 million in 2022, uh, which today nowadays, guys, I did the math, it's worth about uh, tw uh, one, almost $1. 1.5 million nowadays. Yeah, it's, it's, it's $1 million and a half million. 1.5 million. 1.5, yeah, exactly. And requested four parachutes upon landing in Seattle. And you guys are going to see here why you asked for the four parachutes here in a second. After releasing the passengers in Seattle, the hijacker instructed the flight crew to refuel the aircraft and begin a second flight to Mexico City with a refueling stop in Reno, Nevada. About 30 minutes after taking off from Seattle, the hijacker opened the aircraft's uh, aft door, deployed the staircase, and parachuted into the night over southwestern Washington. The hijacker has never been found or conclusively identified. OK, so I got this documentary here, guys, from uh, Lamino. Shout out to Angie for finding this one. Um, we went through a bunch of documentaries, guys. I probably watched like three or four. Um, Angie and Kim watched a few more. I watched like four. Uh, to try to get you guys the best one that also wouldn't get us hit with the copyright. But we, it's OK. Don't worry. We're going to go ahead and play portions of other documentaries as well. We're just going to be stopping them uh, frequently for uh, you know commentary. And I think we should be safe. But uh, this one, I think, is going to be the main one that we use. It's pretty informative. And I'm going to be stopping it and giving you our commentary. One. And this comes from Lamino. So shout out to him. Uh, like the, his video. Subscribe to his channel as well. I think he did a pretty good one on Jack the Ripper, if I'm not mistaken, this guy. Because um, you guys have been asking for Jack the Ripper as well for a while. So uh, let's go ahead and play this thing. And uh, we'll pause it as needed. Uh, boom. Don't forget to like the video, by the way. We got 875 of y'all watching right now. Like the video. Just let me know. Just let me know. A daring parachute escape from a flying 727 somewhere between the yeah. search was made of the plane immediately. We don't know who he was, where he came from, or where he went. I expect that we'll keep looking uh, until we find him or find out what happened. And you guys are going to see that there's multiple theories on what might have happened to D.B. Cooper. And we're going to go ahead and explore all of them. Then you guys can go ahead and pick. And if there's anyone in the chat that's a parachuter, that's a trained parachuter, whether you're a paratrooper in the military or you do it just for fun or whatever, um, make sure to be active in the comments. I want to get your guys' perspective as well. In the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a middle-aged man carrying a briefcase walked into Portland International Airport and purchased a one-way ticket to Seattle, Washington. The man identified himself as Dan Cooper. And this is the actual original ticket right here, guys, you can see. And this is really the only handwriting that they have that belongs to him was when he wrote his name right here. And along with 36 other passengers and a crew of six, he soon boarded Northwest Airlines Flight 305. Once aboard, Cooper made himself comfortable in the middle of the last row of seats on the right side of the cabin. He ordered a drink and had a smoke because this was the 70s. And here you go, guys, real fast. Here is a copy of the actual ticket from the official FBI website. And they pretty much closed the case, guys, back in uh, 2016. Uh, and now this is in the museum, the FBI museum. You can see here, Northwest Orient, Dan Cooper, uh, Seattle. Pretty much he paid 20 bucks for the ticket. <laughs> Which, um, real quick, Angie, can you see what $20 was in 1971 compared to today? Sure. Uh, and you can see here... 
he was uh, where he was trying to go, et cetera, November 24th, 1971. So the really interesting stuff. It's a piece of American history nowadays. And just so y'all know, um, he uh, was... It was $149. $149 today? Yeah. Okay. So um, just so y'all know, this was the only successful plane hijacking in American history was yeah. the DB Cooper This is case. the only one that hasn't been found just yet. Yes. Once the flight was cleared for departure, Cooper turned around and handed an envelope to flight attendant Florence Schaffner. Inside the envelope was a note featuring a handwritten message stating he had a bomb. Schaffner reluctantly sat down beside him and glimpsed what appeared to be eight sticks of dynamite inside his briefcase. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a little bit more illustrated for you guys. I actually have the interview of Miss Schaffner right here for y'all, man. Shout out to Fairy <laughs> I was able to pull up this old ass uh, Unsolved Mysteries episode where they actually have her and ask her some questions. So let's go ahead and pull that up real quick and play. You'll need to put this under your front seat, please. He handed me a note and he kept looking at me. And, and there she is right there. And just so you guys know, uh, she didn't immediately open it up because back then, right? You know, they were out there, you know, pretty much thinking women deserve less, right? Bomb and yeah, uh, that's the way yeah, people like, flirt back then. That's how they flirted back then. And then also, like, flight attendants were very sexual. Um, they were sexualized quite a bit in mainstream media, etc. So it was very common for flight attendants to get notes from, you know, businessmen, traveling yeah. lonely guys, whatever it may be. So she ignored it for a bit. She just took the note and was like, okay, whatever. But then he was like, no, no, no. You better look at that fucking note, lady. Um, he didn't say fucking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he didn't say that, but you guys get the point. But he told he was very um, persistent that you need to look at the snow, and that's when she saw what was going on. But this is the actual flight attendant that received the original note from him. And I just ignored him the first time he looked at me, and then, then he said, I want you to read the note. It was printed, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I want you to sit beside me. This is no joke. There's a bomb in here. I saw a big battery with six. Holy. And just so you guys know, because some of you guys are probably wondering, like, what the hell? How does this guy get a bomb on the plane? Guys, back in 1971, there was zero security at airports, okay? You walk in, you put, you know, take 20 bucks. Hey, I want to fly to XYZ. Cool. Boom. And then you walk on, no security, no nothing, okay? And uh, it was just a different time. They didn't. They... In fact, uh, it's because of this case that the uh, airlines started taking like consideration into security. They, like they started like adding more protocols uh, of security protocols into you know the process of taking a plane. Yeah, everyone wants to blame you know Muhammad and them, right? But, Hello, but the reality is, is this guy's do DB Cooper's fault because that's mm -hmm. when they started taking security really seriously after this, and they actually um, stopped flying planes. That had the, uh, you guys are going to see here, the stairway that comes out the back on 727 after this uh, situation Actually, as well. Another thing is that they use those planes uh, because uh, those kind of planes were used a lot in the Vietnam War. So yes. because of, of the parachute. Uh, the CIA was using it to drop off supplies yeah. and soldiers. And then because of the, because of the war ended, they started using us commercial um, planes. So then they started like, you know, like what one Marin just said that they stopped using those kind of planes because people started hijacking even more after D.B. Cooper. So you'll see like D.B. Cooper was like a, you know, like the first Some copycats one. Yeah. came out after him. Yeah. Again, I saw some of you guys were saying McCoy, etc. You guys are going to see here why it probably wasn't McCoy here in a bit. But uh, but yeah, so uh, for some of you younger guys out there that are like, how the hell did this guy get a bomb on a plane in the 1970s? Things were different. You just put 20 bucks down and you go wherever the hell you want. It's not like nowadays where you got to reserve it, go through security, all that other stuff. None of that back then. Dynamite sticks wrapped around the battery. And he said to me, all I have to do is attach this wire to this gadget here and we all be dead. And so began one of the most infamous crimes in U.S. history. Cool. So... Yeah, back then you can also like you, someone just said it in the chat. You can also smoke, which is crazy to me when I was oh, watching yeah. these these documentaries. Like this guy is, smoked like eight cigarettes yes. in the whole flight, yep. and it was a thirty minute flight, like to Seattle at least, because you'll see later that he changed the whole thing. Yeah, but, like, he smoked eight cigarettes. 
in a, in a plane. I mean, how could people be there? Like even smell the smoke coming of the cigarettes. It's just crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, and, and you go to other parts of the world, they, they chain smoke like that. But yeah, in the United States, that's, that's not a thing anymore. But yeah, back in the 70s, they didn't give a shit, man. Cooper's demands were quite simple. He wanted $200,000 in cash and four parachutes. He also demanded a fuel truck to stand ready to refuel the aircraft once... Pay attention to that, guys. He wanted four parachutes, okay? ...they landed in Seattle. Should they fail to comply with his demands, he threatened to, quote, do the job. Once the flight was airborne, Schaffner went to inform the cop... Okay, let me read that note for y'all one more time back. <laughs> I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash. Put it in a knapsack. I want two black parachutes... No, excuse me. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. Actually, do this the... is not the original note. The original that... note, the original note will say, uh, I want 200,000 in American currency, negotiable American currency. He used that word, that specifically. Like, well, they don't know because they never got the original note. Yeah, no, I know. But it, what the, the... The pilot, yeah, the pilot said back, um, what, yeah, because... When the pilot was communicating and they were able to get the transcripts, yeah. he was saying, we need $200,000 of a negotiable currency. Yeah. And, but they don't know if that's what he said on the note, but they're like, okay, maybe but he inferred that, that. That's a main, that's a main thing. Like, it's a very, very important, like, thing to say, because people will also create, like, a conspiracy theory that this guy was Canadian because of those game of words. Yes. Because he said American negotiable currency. Yes. Yeah. In the, the notes. Um, so yeah, this it, it, there is speculation for sure that he could have been a dual citizen uh, or been Canadian. Yeah. Job. Once the flight was airborne, Schaffner went to inform the cockpit crew while another flight attendant by the name of Tina Mucklow remained by Cooper's side. By using a telephone in the rear of the cabin, Mucklow acted as an intermediary between Cooper and the rest of the flight crew for the remainder of the hijacking. The for the next uh, hour and a half, flight three of... Real quick, Tina Mucklow, who was she, guys? She was the one that pretty much was with him the whole time. Uh, and here she is right here. Actually, you know what? Let me go back. We'll play this for a bit, and then I'll show you the, the, the Tina Mucklow angle. By maintained a holding pattern near Seattle, while local and federal authorities scrambled to procure the ransom, as well as the four parachutes. Now, mind you guys, this is a 30-minute flight, but they ended up staying on the air much longer just so they can go ahead and gather the parachutes and the money. $10,020 bills were collected from a local bank, while the owner of a nearby skydiving school supplied the chutes. At 5.45 p.m., more than two hours past its scheduled arrival, Fly 305 finally touched down in Seattle. By this point, it was well after sunset, and the aircraft was brought to a remote section of the tarmac. I just want to Once say the something. flight came to us, I don't, I don't remember if they say in, the, in this documentary, but back then, two thousand two hundred thousand uh, dollars weighed like twenty three pounds yes. in twenty dollar bills, yes. which is like a lot. Yeah, he he didn't specify the denominations of currency he wanted. Yeah. Uh, so they ended up just giving it to him in twenty dollar bills, and it cost yeah about twenty three pounds, twenty one to twenty three pounds. So, yeah, uh, which is a lot. Yeah, to to you know to, to jump out of a plane with. Yeah. Stop. Both the ransom and the parachutes were handed over to Mucklow, who then brought them back aboard. In exchange, Cooper permitted two of the flight attendants, as well as all the passengers, to disembark. Many of whom had not yet realized the flight had been hijacked. None of them knew. It wasn't until they actually landed, guys, and there was FBI agents trying to question them that they found out that they had been um, yeah. held. Uh, they had kind of been hijacked. And um, Cooper was smart. He did this on purpose so there wouldn't be panic and people wouldn't come and attack him. Yeah. With the ransom paid and only four crew members remaining on board, Cooper told Mucklow to inform the captain that he wanted to fly to Mexico City. They were to fly with the landing gear down, the flaps at 15 degrees and below 10,000 feet. The lights and... Okay, so as y'all can see already, extremely detailed instructions, okay? This is stuff that typically someone that is very familiar with planes, maybe even a pilot, would ask. Because average Joe ain't gonna know that you can even do all this stuff and no proper altitudes to be flying at with flaps and all this other stuff out. So um, this tells you quite a bit about the individual being very familiar with planes and parachuting to a degree. Now, there's a little bit of contention here in the D.B. Cooper world, which, you know, I found this out from doing the research. But 
off of this alone, you guys can already tell he's more aware than 99% of people. The cabin were to be switched off, and the aft stairway, which opens from the underbelly of the fuselage, was to remain extended. And again, this is something exclusive to only 727 planes back in that era, guys, okay? As Angie was saying before, um, back then, the CIA was using 727s to allow um, people to basically secretly jump out of the back of the plane to su supply soldiers and um, supplies uh, during the Vietnam War. Two of Cooper's demands could not be satisfied. First of all, the flight configuration he'd requested would not allow for a non-stop flight to Mexico City. As such, Cooper proposed a refueling stop in Phoenix, Yuma, or Sacramento before they all agreed on Reno, Nevada. Second of all, it was not possible to depart with a ventral staircase extended. Cooper agreed to retract the stairs on the condition that Mucklow remained by his side and taught him how to extend. And he wasn't happy about that, guys. He wanted to take off with the with the, um, stairway the stairway open, mm -hmm. but obviously that would have been impossible to do for the pilot, you know, because of cabin pressure and all this other stuff. And then once the plane was airborne, parked for nearly two hours due to complications with refueling, Flight 305 was back in the air by 7:36 p.m. Less than five minutes after takeoff, Cooper told Mucklow to head for the cockpit and that from this point onwards, he was not to be disturbed. The last time she saw Cooper, he was standing in the middle of the aisle as if though he was preparing to jump. Um, before, yeah, that's pretty be, G though, I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, uh, <laughs> before, on that time, because it was two hours, this guy waiting for the plane to, to, to take off. He grew very impatient with like the crew and everything yeah. because the pilot was just like tr trying to figure out how to get to Mexico City or to Reno Nevada, and like he was trying to seek like routes to take those, you know, to to take the plane there. Yeah, and he used to grow so impatient that he just told the the pilot to you know to get the show going. Yeah, he said, "Let's get the show on the road." Was the, his exact wording. Let's get wording. the show on the road. Um, yeah. because yeah, he was start because basically he didn't even tell the pilot to take a certain route because he just wanted to get the hell off uh, off there. Yeah. Because at this point, guys, the plane is surrounded as they're on the floor, right on the they're on the on the tarmac. The plane was surrounded by FBI agents with rifles. So um, he told the flight attendants to close all the blinds so they wouldn't shoot him. And uh, he asked for four parachutes. And you guys are going to see here in a little bit why he asked for four parachutes. It was actually an ingenious idea. But uh, the 1970s were a different time. Okay, yeah. guys, I'll tell you all that when it comes to law enforcement and what they would do with criminals. But um, that's why he wanted the blinds covered. And uh, he needed that woman there with him as an insurance, especially since they didn't want to lower the uh, the stairway for him. And also from this point on, they they had like two jets to score the flight. Of course. Ah, uh, yes, the Air Force. Air Force had two. Air Force, yes, yeah. yeah, had two uh, two fighter jets mm -hmm. following the plane as well. But it was dark as hell, so they couldn't see anything. And windy. And windy as well. Mucklow joined the rest of the crew, locked the cockpit door behind her, and some three hours later, Flight 305 safely landed in Reno. Once the flight came to a stop, the crew carefully ventured into the rear of the cabin, but there was no sign. That's an actual photo That's from the photo, plane. Yeah. And of Cooper, nor the bomb. The aft stairway had been extended mid-flight and was slightly damaged upon landing. It seemed there was only one explanation for the hijacker's absence. At some point between Seattle and Reno, Cooper had strapped on a parachute, walked down the stairs, and leaped into the dark of night. Crazy. So here, I'm going to show you guys a little clip here from the um, D.B. Cooper Netflix series, okay, um, of kind of this situation. And four parachutes aboard, the plane headed for Reno. Cooper looks into the money bag. He's happy. And he has instructions. He's asking to fly at 250 miles an hour, which is slow for a jet, with the flaps down at minimum height. Even the pilots didn't know the aircraft was capable of flying that slow and that low. And he said, it can be done. Do it. They head south over this area called the Dark Divide. Tina Mucklow was alone with him, sitting in the last row. And here she is, along with uh, Schaffner. Florence, yeah. He was not nervous. He seemed rather nice, and other than he wanted certain things to be done. When he asked for his, uh, just so y'all know, fun little fact, when he asked for his, uh, bur he asked for uh, bourbon, and seven up. And seven up. Uh, he actually paid for it, <laughs> which is kind of funny 
Because it's like, oh, yeah, here you go, by the way. It's like, what the hell, bro? You got the plane hijacked. You're going to actually pay for your drinks? Okay, fair enough. Um, but he was cordial to the to the staff. He wasn't too rude. Um, he was very authoritative, like, hey, I need you guys to do this, X, Y, Z, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But um, his intention was never really to hurt anybody in the staff. And they don't even know if the, if the dynamite or anything like that was real. So, um, no, 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 guys. He didn't use the stolen money to pay for it. This was before he got the money from uh, the ransom money. He paid yeah. for the drink prior. He had drank the the bourbon and was he was smoking cigarettes. Yeah, that was kind of like one of the things, the first things he did. Like he just asked for a bourbon and a soda, and then he started smoking cigarettes. Yeah, and he paid for the for the drink. You know. Yeah, this is kind of. And then he slid the note to the to the. <laughs> to the <girl>. <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked for another one after, even after he had the plane under under his command. It's crazy to me that he he gave the notes and then he was like, "Yeah, I need those notes back." You know, like he was like, yes, I need those notes back. <laughs> yeah. Just so you guys know, actually, another really smart thing that he did was uh, he when after um, before he jumped out the plane, he told the the lady to give him back all all the notes that he had written, all the handwritten notes. So the only handwriting sample they have of him, guys, is, is, the, is, is, ticket. is the plane ticket right here where he writes his name in. Once again. Boom. You're not and, showing oh, it. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Here it is right here, guys. And let me go ahead and enlarge it for y'all real fast so we can really get a good look at this thing. You can see right here, Dan Cooper. Okay. And then they're finding out, guys, that the name Dan Cooper came from a comic book series out of yeah. Canada that was written in French. And the main character in it was uh, was a military individual, I think, who would be jumping out of planes and going on missions. It was basically a, a French comic book series based out of Canada. Mm-hmm. And that is what led people to believe that there was a high likelihood that D.B. Cooper was um, at least Canadian or familiar with Canadian culture and or familiar with this comic book series. Um, and then also what Angie said, what the uh, negotiable U.S. currency. I mean, come on, let's be honest here. No American's going to, oh, bro, I, I need a 200,000 negotiable U.S. currency. Now nah, you're going to say, give me 200K, motherfucker. Yeah. That's what an American's going to say. But for you to say 200K of a negotiable currency, even though they don't have it in print, that when they listen to... They never used the word dollars. Yes. Yes. When, when, when the... Uh, when the pilot was relaying the information and they were listening back to the black box or whatever it may be, they saw that the pilot was using that terminology, which is strange. So that's what led people to think that it's possible that the hijacker was Canadian and or potentially dual citizen. And also, guys, they didn't know his they could, his accent was unrecognizable, which uh, which is very common with with, uh, you know, Americans and Canadians. Like unless you like really pay attention, um, there's only a few words that will distinguish a Canadian from an American. Right. A boot. Right. That's one of them. I would say that it gives away a Canadian all the time. And I can I cannot tell the difference yeah. between the accents. <laughs> yeah. Like and there be foreigners like Angie that could barely speak English. They're not going to be able to know. But yeah, there's certain words that Canadians say that Americans say that you can tell. So like my big one that I could tell it's a Canadian is they say uh, about um, what else um, did they say a a lot when they finish their sentences. Uh, what else? What do you mean? What is what? a? Yeah. Like they'll. When, so when they finish, they'll be like. Hey, what are your thoughts on that, eh? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and then and, and they'll, 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 that's a common term that a lot of them. Well, Eastern Canadians. I don't even. I'm not even sure what, they, uh, what um, like Canadians from the West Coast. They uh, what some of their terminology is, but um, but yeah. See, yeah, everyone in the chat. I thought I Canadian thought Canadians like will speak like with a strong French accent. Some of them do if they're from Montreal. Uh, from Montreal. Montreal, which is Eastern Canada, Eastern Canada. Isn't a Quebec or Quebec? Is it that house? Quebec. 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 Okay, that this this the like the main Canadian uh, part of that speaks like most French. Um, I, yeah, Quebec speaks French, and then so does uh, Montreal. Okay. Yeah, and then Alberta too, I guess. Okay, so we got some Canadians in the house that might be able to quote. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, let's get back to the to the doc here. But yeah, guys, this is what the the ticket looked like. So that's really the only handwriting they have. So he was smart enough to know. That they were gonna want this. Um, uh. At that point, Cooper sent Tina Mucklow to the cockpit and told her not to come out. He was in the back uh, all by himself. Around eight twelve, there was sort of a popping sensation in the ears of the pilots. Okay, that's when they knew that he had lowered the stairway, guys. When they heard that popping sound, because obviously the pressure in the cabin changed. The pressure in the cabin has changed. The aft stairs have gone down. I told the 
air traffic controllers that I think our friend just took leave of us. To truly appreciate what Cooper did, close your eyes and take a step and imagine walking down those aft stairs. It's late at night, there's a lot of rain. Oh, Guys, the conditions that night, real quick, yeah. were fucking horrible. That's that was what I was, I was <laughs> about to say. He was wearing a suit. Okay, I even draw it here. <laughs> he was wearing a suit. <laughs> Wait, show those notes again? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> he was wearing like a... Angie came prepared. Yeah, I was like, I was reading that because he was wearing a suit and um, how do you call this like long... Trench coat. Yes. Yeah. He also was wearing that. And that was it. <laughs> he was not wearing boots. He was not wearing like warm, like warm clothes, anything. He was just wearing like a suit and this like coat. Yeah. And that's it. And he just flew into the wine. And, and, a, and like, a clip on tie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that he just like, took it off and threw it away <laughs> on the plane before throwing himself to nothing. Yeah. So Jeez, yeah, th- he's gonna describe the conditions that night, guys. It's yeah, it, it's it's wild. Let's let's see here. Shout out to Angie W notes. <laughs> You're hearing the engines of this jet in your ear. Imagine looking out in the middle of the darkness and then walking down another step and another step. And just looking out, asking yourself the question. Probably was fully torqued at this point. Like, yes, I bought a pull off the greatest hijacking ever. When's the time to jump? <laughs> Crazy. All right, let's go back to the other one because I already know uh, Netflix be hating. So. This guy is like a John Wick. Yeah, facts. He had the John Wick suit, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now the manhunt begins, guys. As soon as it became clear that Cooper was no longer on board, dozens of FBI... That's the actual plan you guys can see here. Huge. 727 Northwest Airlines. FBI agents converged upon the aircraft only to discover a disappointing amount of physical evidence. A black clip-on tie eight cigarette butts and two of the four parachutes were all that Cooper left behind. Evidently, he'd brought the ransom and briefcase along with him. In interviews conducted on the night of the hijacking, Cooper was described by the crew and passengers as a white male with brown eyes and dark hair. He appeared to be in his mid-40s and wore a dark trench coat, a dark suit, a white shirt, a black tie and dark shoes. Soon after boarding, he'd also donned a pair of sunglasses. Based on this description, the FBI produced the first of several composite sketches. Before they could mount a search, however, the FBI had to figure out when Cooper abandoned the ship. But that was easier said than done. None of the four crew members witnessed Cooper jumping from the plane, nor did the pilots of two fighter jets which escorted the flight between Seattle and Reno, which is not all. And keep in mind, guys, the fighter jets couldn't go that slow at about 200 miles per hour, so it was very difficult for them to keep up with the uh, with the plane, yeah. So that was because they, they would were, have to circle it around. They, that's yeah, exactly. All too surprising, given it. Which Cooper probably did that on purpose, so that because he knew that they were probably going to go ahead and scramble jets around him. Mm-hmm. So he did that on purpose, make the plane uh, fly low and slow, so it would be difficult for the fighter jets to actually witness when he when he jumped out the plane. Was the middle or see him jump out the plane? Love the night. Although the flight crew did report something odd, the last communication with a hijacker occurred at approximately 8 or 5 p.m. when the crew used the intercom to offer assistance, which Cooper declined. Within the next 10 minutes, the crew experienced what they described as an oscillation or vibration of the aircraft. And- um, so we know that he jumped out the plane around 8, 10 p.m., guys. At the time, the crew suspected it might have been produced by Cooper's jump, and a subsequent recreation of the hijacking supported that conclusion. Okay, so that took care of the when, but what about the where? While Cooper was very explicit about the flight's configuration and destination, he never specified any kind of route. In fact, Cooper grew so impatient with the slow refueling in Seattle that he dismissed the captain's request to file a flight plan and simply told him to quote, get the show on the road. As such, the captain chose to fly along an airway known as Victor 23 without any input from Cooper. 
By using Victor 23 as a guide, authorities estimated the most probable location of the flight at the approximated time of the jump was about 40 kilometers north of Portland. And so, at the break of dawn, the FBI mounted an impressive search operation using helicopters, airplanes, and ground troops. So this is the area, guys, that they cordoned off that they think he could have landed in, um, which, you know, obviously they're using the time approximately when he jumped, how fast they were going, etc. If I'm not mistaken, the how plane was flying at like 170 knots. Uh, and the also temperature how at the, the time wind was going to the wind was going west, if I'm not mistaken, and they believe that uh, the temperature was uh, it was below zero. I just can't remember how many degrees below zero, but uh, but it was cold, guys. I mean, it's November 24th, the day before Thanksgiving, yeah. uh, in the Pacific Northwest, so you already know it's gonna be freezing. God damn it. <laughs> The problem was, even if the estimated bailout point was accurate, Cooper's eventual landing or drop zone was far more difficult to pinpoint. The loosely defined search area covered a vast stretch of mountainous wilderness occluded by a dense forest, so it was truly like finding a needle in a haystack. Apart from the difficult terrain, the search was further complicated by low temperatures and inclement weather, which persisted for days. Despite their best efforts, authorities never managed to find a single trace of Cooper, nor the items he brought along with him. Well, not until 1980, which we're going to hear here in a second. Also, guys... Such a spoiler, Mike. <laughs> well, they, I'm not going to say what they found. You'll see it here in a second. And just so you guys know, by the way, uh, the reason why Cooper asked for four parachutes, guys, which was actually really smart 4D chess, was because... He wanted the FBI to think he was going to take hostages. So if they gave him a dummy parachute, they would have basically allowed one of the uh, victims that he would take hostage with him to die. So since he asked for four parachutes, they were like, damn it, we can't go ahead and give him a dummy parachute. We got to give him all good parachutes because we don't know who he's going to take with him. So that was how he basically created an insurance policy for himself to make sure that they wouldn't give him a dummy parachute and let him uh, fall to his death. That's a theory because that was never confirmed. But yeah, that's a theory that he might have done that. And they actually well, what gave... What other reason would it be then? Because, I don't know, but that's a theory. But they actually gave him a dummy parachute. Oh, no, no. It was a uh, it was a training one, but it still worked. Yeah, but they call him dummy parachute. I mean, dummy as in, like, it wouldn't deploy. Yeah. And yeah. He, they gave him, like, a civilian luxury parachute and a military parachute. That was the one he took. As long with, like... The dummy parachute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He took he took the uh, he took the military one and the training the, one. Yeah, and the training one. But um, the training one still worked. It just wasn't um, as I guess, efficient. As efficient, but it still yeah. worked. But his fear was well, as suspected, was that they would give him a parachute that doesn't work at all. Yeah. And uh, and then he would just fall to his death because the 1970s were different. But <laughs> but uh, but that was actually a smart idea for him to ensure that they wouldn't um, try to fuck him over. Yeah, this man was very clever. Because 200,000 200, guys back then was, again, that's 1.5 million today's dollars. Having made little to no progress by early December, the FBI turned their attention to the $200,000 ransom. The money had been collected from the Seattle First National Bank, which maintained a ransom package of $250,000 just for such an occasion. So, so th this is also something, this is me speculating here, okay? But for him to ask for $200,000, right? It, that seems like a very specific number as if it would have been able to be given to him fairly quickly. And it just so happens that the closest, that there's a bank that keeps $200,000 Ready to go with oral serial numbers yeah. recorded. I mean, that doesn't sound like that sounds a little bit like too much of a coincidence to me. But in twenty dollars bill. What were you gonna say? In twenty dollars bill. So. And twenty dollar bills. So like, so the, it's not like they, you know, sat there, guys, and counted it. It was like, okay, two hundred k. Let's record all the serial numbers. No, the money bag was pretty much ready to go with all of the serial numbers yeah. already recorded, guys. Which is why they were able to get it out to him so quickly. Yeah. Because of this, the serial numbers of the $10,020 banknotes given to Cooper had been documented in advance, a complete list of which were quickly made available to financial institutions, government agencies, and the... Yeah, I know some of you guys in the chat are like, what the fuck, bro, that'd be for the 1970s. Yeah, the 1970s were different, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the bank robberies and ransom was so common, they're like, all right, bro, like, just, just, let's just have uh, 50 to 250K just sitting around. If some yeah. guy makes a crazy demand, let's just give him the money. 
it is what it is. Actually, there is a bunch of people that admire this man. Yeah, there is. One of, I'm one of them, to be honest with you, because this guy is like a... But he's just a W. Yeah, like he's folklore just folklore legend. Yeah, and there is a, a town uh, near Seattle or Portland. I don't remember. Okay, it's called Ariel. It. That has like a, a whole pub that celebrates the Dan Dan Cooper uh, DB Cooper uh, Day every year, one day before Thanksgiving, and they make like these huge parties where they just celebrate to him and they make toast on his name. Yeah, it's this crazy. is it right here. I'll show y'all real fast. It's um. It's called the Ariel uh, David uh, Cooper Tavern. Yeah, the Ariel uh, Ariel in a Ariel Washington. Oh, okay. I think this is it right here. David Cooper Day. Uh, David Cooper Day at the Ariel General Store and Tavern, an annual celebration of the infamous unsolved skyjacking. Because uh, I think where they suspect that he landed was in that area. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and people actually like dress like him. <laughs> yes, they have a they have a um, a competition. Yeah. To, to see who could get the best D.B. Cooper costume. Which is crazy. And he's a bunch of old people. Facts. <laughs> so it's a bunch of people that might have known him. And, you know, it's like, just crazy people, to be honest with you. Americans General. just be doing crazy shit. Yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> Public. The intention was to make it as difficult as possible for Cooper to spend his money. Northwest Airlines and several newspapers even began to offer rewards to anyone who could find a note with a matching serial number. In spite of these efforts, no one ever did. That is until nearly a decade later. In early 1980, a young boy named Brian Ingram was building a campfire on a small beach in southern Washington. As he was digging into the sand, Ingram discovered three bundles of cash totaling $5,880. Having heard about the information... Can you, um, uh, real yeah, quick, I have get, it here. Uh, yeah, how much that is in today's dollars? Uh, yeah, I have it here. Give me one second. The skyjacking, Ingram's parents brought the severely degraded bundles to the FBI. The notes were promptly inspected, and sure enough, the serial numbers matched those of the ransom. Boom, got it. AKA, got it's it? a match. No, no, no. Uh, so, real quick, guys, I got the actual 1980 uh, news clip from when they found the money. The break in the nine-year-old investigation came Sunday when Dwayne and Patricia Ingram's eight-year-old son overturned some sand while walking the shoreline of the Columbia River near Vancouver, Washington. The public learned in an FBI news conference Tuesday, little Brian Ingram unearthed several packets of deteriorated $20 bills, and the FBI confirmed it. It was indeed several thousand of the $200,000 that bailed out with D.B. Cooper on the eve of Thanksgiving back in 1971. Well, we were going to make a campfire, and we found it. It was partially on top of the ground. You know? It was um, just beneath. Go ahead, yeah, so $5,800 uh, $5, in 1971 is 43000 today. Uh, what about in 1980? Can you do it by 1980? 1980? Because that's when they found it, yeah. Oh, okay. The sand. Who found it? Uh, well, my son and I found it together. I was getting ready to drop the wood. And he cleared out the spot and rolled the money over on top of the sand. Yeah, 21,000. agent scoured the... How much? 21,000. 21,000? Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Wow. Yeah, just... Uh, just uh, Well, the 70s, there was really bad inflation, so that makes sense. Uh, but, okay, twenty. so 21K. Yeah. The area of the Ingram's find, at one point, a geologist was called in to determine whether money might be buried below the surface level in dredge material deposited on the beach in 1974. On Wednesday, that geologist confirmed the money washed ashore. That meant there could be deposits of money anywhere along a 100-mile stretch of beach. Searching in the sand on a deserted Columbia beach, finding bits of money along the high water mark. That's what's changed the whole myth of a man named Dan Cooper. People thought he landed on the west side of the range, but his money was found to be on the east side. That's how it drifted downriver. And now that's what's changing the whole search and the whole story of D.B. Cooper. Cooper landed where he thought his money might have gone by the Lewis River, but then it would have had to go against river current to get where it was found. People who study river flow are checking if tides could have done it. It's doubtful. The more logical route from somewhere upriver. D.B. Cooper bailed out of a Northwest Airlines jet going 200 miles an hour at about 10,000 feet. The best guess is he jumped almost exactly over Le Center, Washington. In fact, a placard from the jet was found near there. But two things add to the confusion. One and the placard from the jet guys was the warning uh, from the stairway that he jumped from. 
at that speed, seconds mean miles, three a minute. Any delay by Cooper from when they thought he jumped puts him further south. Also, he jumped into a major storm. At that altitude, winds could toss him and drift him for many miles. The FBI thought it carried him into Lake Merwin. That was the major search area. But now experts feel he might have gone at least over another ridge, perhaps into the drainage of the Washougal. The speculation does lead to excitement. Are we closer to the secret of D.B. Cooper? Is it somewhere up there? The river is a kayaker's joy, but it is shallow. Could it have carried 21 pounds of $20 bills miles down its length? It did have over eight years to do it, and it does flood often. This is also rough backcountry, but not as rough as the area around Ariel and Lake Merwin, or so the residents tell us. Maybe a man who landed in a parachute could have made it. Long-time residents are talking about that more again now, and about the money that may have flowed through their backyards. Been inside a fishing board. <laughs> I don't even fish. I doubt it. I'd say he's in that Columbia River out there. So. This is remote country. Traveling at 200 miles an hour, many think Cooper was separated from his money, and his chute was ripped to shreds, leaving him at the mercy of the winds, falling. But if he didn't make it, his remains must be up there somewhere, waiting to be found. It's doubtful there will be a modern-day treasure hunt for it, with little to no chance of finding money, virtually none of finding anything of Cooper's. But maybe, maybe someone in this area may be thinking more about the ex-skyjacker, and maybe as lucky as a young Vancouver boy was, spotting yet another clue in what is now the best guess for Cooper's final resting place, the Washougal Drainage Basin. Did Dan Cooper come tumbling down through these trees in southern Washington, or was it somewhere else away from the Washougal River on that Thanksgiving night eight years ago? Chances are people will continue to look for the legend of D.B. Cooper. Chances, though, are slim that we'll ever really know the facts. But maybe it's better that way. Crews continue to dig. Shout out to that 1980s mustache, man. <laughs> By the way, guys, there's 1,400 plus of y'all watching right now. Do me a favor. Go ahead and like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Oh, okay. I knew that was coming. We uh, stream got suspended. It's fine. I'll Why? tell you. Probably because we're playing this news thing or we played a little bit of uh, the other thing. But it's fine. It'll, we'll be back. Are we going to do some super chats then? Uh, well, they're not even live right now. Oh, okay. I'll just tell them, don't worry. Don't worry. Give us one minute. Don't worry. Give us Tell YouTube one content. minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what they do preemptively a lot of the times. Because this will, it's fine. This will get shown on the thing. Yeah, it's back now. Yeah. I think. It, we're going to be back here in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, the, guys... First, because you guys are going to watch this back on the playback. What YouTube does, guys, is if you play anything, what's going to YouTube doesn't know if it's copyrighted or not. So, what they'll do is they'll temporarily suspend the stream, right? Just out of an abundance of caution. And what will end up happening is once the video is fully uploaded and it's all good to go, they'll go ahead and, uh, you know, let it play through. So, when you guys watch this back on the replay, don't worry. It's going to all be there because at the end of the day, this sh stuff isn't copyrighted. But that's what they do typically when you play videos is they just assume that uh because YouTube is them boys. Yeah, YouTube that's why. Yeah, YouTube is them boys. <laughs> but don't worry guys, we're gonna definitely be back here. So give it a minute or so. Uh um, for the people leaving the, the stream, man. Like you guys yeah. are impatient. Yeah, it's cause they think uh but yeah, it'll be back in about what I've when I time it, it's normally about two minutes. Well Tell Susan they're saying be the back chat. in about one. Someone just said, I hate YouTube and women. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just about to be done playing the thing, too. This is why we need to go to Rumble. Yeah, this is true. But don't worry, guys. We'll be back here in a second. And we're back. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Yes. Okay, guys, uh, you guys missed a little conversation that me and Angie had. But just to sum it up for y'all, don't worry. When you guys watch this back on the playback, everything is going to show as seen. It's just that what YouTube does is if you play any type of content that they're not sure about, what they'll do is they'll just go ahead and automatically like suspend the stream for a little bit until you go back to playing your regular stuff and then they'll put it back up. So don't worry about it. Um, we're back. We'll, we'll be fine for the rest of the play. I'm, I'm going to stop playing that news article, but you guys get the idea. Do me a favor though. Since I know that they're going to try to shadow ban this video, go ahead, mm -hmm. like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, and yeah, let's get back to it. We're going to go ahead and play um, <clears throat> this, uh, the clip, the video from um, Lamino. Subscribe to the channel if you guys haven't already. Let me go ahead and put this back up for y'all. Boom. 
once the excitement subsided, however, the money managed to raise far more questions than it answered. The most significant of which was how? How did the money... So just to recap, you guys. Um, so Manchin gets on a plane, uh, requests $200,000, says that he has a bomb in his briefcase. They go ahead, they land um, where they're in their destination, refuel the, the plane, 727. He gets his money, he gets four parachutes. Uh, he asked for the parachutes specifically to be four because, you know, so they would give him good parachutes that would work because they weren't sure if he's going to take hostages. He jumps out somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> and about almost, what, nine years later, a kid and his dad find the money um, right by the beach. And just so you guys know, by the way, here is a photo of the money um, and the tie. I'll go ahead and share a screen with y'all real quick and it's, show you guys on this. It's on the FBI uh, website. website. This is oh, from yeah. the official FBI website. So here's a clip-on tie that he had, which made people think that he might be left-handed because of the way uh, that was clipped. And then here is the money recovered in 1980 that ran matched the ransom money serial numbers um, from the bank that the money was taken from. So obviously this is a historical case now, so the FBI keeps all this stuff in their museum. Yeah. There is actually... Uh, I don't know. I don't remember if it's on because I, I guys forgive me if, if I'm repeating myself in these things because I watch too many documentaries and I don't know which one mentions what. So uh, there is a theory that there is not a theory that they made us to a study in 2009, I think, about the bands, the elastic bands that the money was found. Oh, uh, yes. And. I don't know if you saw it, but they they like ruled out the theory about he he might have like that that money was found in the water and that stuff like it wasn't because the rubber band wouldn't have you know lasted that, that long. long underwater or or like you know like natural circumstances like natural environment. I don't know. I don't know if you can explain it better. <laughs> uh, yeah, you made zero sense there. Stupid. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, basically, what, what she's trying to say, guys, is that there's a theory that he buried the money versus the money being, uh, go, uh, you know, flowing through the water, etc. Because the rubber bands that were used to secure the money would not have been able to endure uh, the natural elements for that long period of time. So th there's a theory that D.B. Cooper went to that area and specifically buried the money to be found later on. That's yeah. uh, what some people say. And there's a lot of th conspiracy theories with this case, guys, right? But it's still unsolved. This is probably one of the biggest unsolved cases in American history, along with the Zodiac Killer, John Benet Ramsey, etc. End up so far away from the drop zone. I might do a playlist for y'all just on unsolved cases, matter of fact, now that I think about it. Looking at this map, it might be tempting to think that Cooper simply dropped some of the money, which then fell into the Lewis River. The bundles could then have been carried further downstream by the Columbia River before finally being washed ashore at Tina Bar, which is the name of the beach. Tina Mucklo, Tina Bar, coincidence? Yeah, yes. coincidence. Anyway, <laughs> the problem with this idea is that the Columbia River flows in the opposite direction. This has led some, including members of the FBI, to re-evaluate initial drop zone assessment. For instance, if the drop zone was much further southeast, close to a river called the Washougal River, it is conceivable, albeit improbable, that the money floated all the way down. Also, uh, Stella Rise makes a good comment here. D.B. Cooper escaped yet. Yo, he was an experienced jumper who also knew the area. He recognized Tacoma from the sky. He was very calm and used terminology to suggest experience around aircraft. Yes, he also recognized the military base as well while they were circling around, waiting for the money to be, uh, to be gathered. He also recognized the military base and area as well. So, and he picked a military parachute, which led um, people to believe that he was potentially a paratrooper back in the day. He, so he also mentioned that the Air Force base was like about 20, 20 minutes drive from the airport. Is that what you said? Uh, no, he saw it from the sky. I didn't know about the him saying yeah, it was a twenty minute the, drive. To the to the girl, to the to the to the lady that that the Moksher, Moksher, I think it's called, the Air Force Base was only 20 minute. it was on a, a 20 minute drive from the from the airport that they were going to land in Seattle. Mm, so okay. that, that also and he goes. saw from the sky too. So he knew where he was at, guys. He was very familiar with the Northwest, uh, the Pacific Northwest for sure. On to Tina Bar. Alternatively, the bundles may have simply landed on the beach if the flight path was further to the west. Even so, natural explanations struggle to explain how three independent, potentially free-falling and or free-floating bundles of cash ended up at the exact same place on the same beach. 
To complicate matters, sediment from the riverbed was excavated and dumped onto Tina Bar as part of a dredging operation in 1974. And according to one analysis, the money was discovered above this layer of sediment. If true, that would mean the money came to rest at Tina Bar sometime after 1974. But a re-examination of that analysis found that what was believed to be a layer of deposited sediment might actually have been a perfectly natural layer of clay. Not only that, but the sediment was clearly dumped some distance away from where the money was discovered. Furthermore, when Ingram discovered the bundles, the rubber bands which held them together... Oh, hold on. Uh, making sure that we're still good. Okay, it looks like we're still live. Okay, just making sure. Because someone put in the chat, stream unavailable or some crap like that. Guys, you can't you can't mess around like that. Because then you, you heard the quad of the show for everybody else. Because I just paused it randomly to make sure. So, please no trolling. Yeah, there were still intact. This is significant because experiments conducted in 2009 revealed that this brand of rubber bands could go. not withstand exposure to open air or water for more than a year. This is what Andrew was trying to describe for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so unless the bundles were somehow protected from the elements, they must have become buried at Tina Bar within a year of the hijacking. The most probable explanation, therefore, seems to be that Cooper or someone else deliberately buried the money. Did Cooper survive and bury the money himself? Did someone else bury the money after stumbling upon Cooper's remains? If there is an explanation which does not require human intervention, it's managed to elude investigators for decades. Suffice it to say, this is a mystery within a mystery. Since Ingram's discovery in 1980, both Tina Bar and the grounds around the Bushugal River have been subjected to numerous searches, but to date, there's been no sign of Cooper nor the rest of the money. So now we're going to get into the suspects, guys. Um, I think this is, yeah, this chapter is the suspects, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, Leap of Faith. Okay. From the very beginning, it was assumed by many that Cooper did not survive his daring escape. And don't worry, guys, I'm going to go into the theory of why he potentially did not survive uh, the jump as well. I'm going to play another video from National Geographic where um, one of the scientists goes into his theory on what he thinks happened. And, you know, we'll present both sides for you guys and you guys can go ahead and decide what you want. But I think it's important to present all of the sides and then you go from there. It would not make for a very thrilling conclusion to this story, but that's the thing about stories. They're usually far more exciting than reality. While there is no hard evidence for nor against Cooper's survival, the assumption that he fell to his death is not without merit. When Cooper leaped into the darkness, Flight 305 was plowing through a frigid rainstorm at roughly 170 knots, 10,000 feet above southern Washington. The wind was so violent that it ripped out a placard from the aft stairway, which was later recovered in 19... And that's what, and when we're watching that news article, by the way, guys, th uh, that's what was found by another person in that same area uh, and later on, a few years later. 1978, almost directly below the estimated flight path. To say that Cooper was not dressed for the occasion it would be an understatement. The ground beneath him, meanwhile, was obscured by multiple layers of clouds, which likely means that Cooper jumped without knowing his precise location. Even if he could see the ground and had a specific drop zone in mind, the parachute he selected was non-steerable, meaning he would not have been able to steer his descent towards a specific landing spot. Thus precluding That's very important, guys, because that means that he would have been at the mercy of the winds, which, if I'm not mistaken, that night we're going in a westerly uh, direction. In ...any potential coordination with an accomplice stationed on the ground. While Cooper expressed some familiarity with parachutes, his actual competence level is up for debate. It's widely believed that Cooper demanded two pairs of parachutes, two primary and two reserve, to make the authorities believe that he intended to take a hostage. That is precisely what happened as the FBI contemplated, but eventually decided against sabotaging the shoots as they did not want to risk the life of an innocent civilian. But in their haste to obtain them, they unintentionally provided Cooper with a non-functional dummy chute intended for training purposes. This mishap seems to have gone unnoticed by Cooper because that dummy chute was one of the two missing from the plane. Not only that, but Cooper chose the older and technically inferior parachute out of the two I primary so chutes provided. Well, is that you drew that as well? Yeah. 
No, actually, you know what, Angie? It looks like you're right. The one of them was you're... a training dummy shoot, but I don't know if that means it works. <laughs> yeah, I, wait, go, go ahead, show that to the thing again to the audience. So, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, for trade. So, someone, someone in the in the chat, if, if anyone I, here is a is a. Uh, I drew this here, this thing, money, like the money signs, because that's what he put. It was the money. Believed, he put, yeah. Yeah, guys. Anyone here that's uh, um, that die that jumps out of planes or anything like that is a parachuter. Let us know if a dummy shoot still deploys, like if you can still use it. If it's for training purposes, that means it's got to work. Like it's not like it's going to like like not pay, deploy and the person just falls to their death. It probably just isn't as efficient. But uh, let me know, guys. Yeah. Thing is that the parachute that he used, the military one, was a, a, was a backpack. Mm. A diff- and that was a difference between the others, I think. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So in both cases, it seems like Cooper made the worst possible choice. But there are other ways to interpret this information. For instance, it's possible that Cooper used the dummy shoot not as a reserve, but as a means to secure the bag of money. In fact, that is precisely what Cooper tried to do with the functional reserve shoot. First, he tried to place the money in the shoot's canopy before removing some of the suspension lines and wrap them around the bag. Perhaps he used the dummy shoot for a similar purpose. And Cooper's decision to use the older primary chute is not necessarily an indication of inexperience. It could also be a sign of familiarity because the chute he left behind was a civilian luxury chute, while the one he used was a military chute. So that right there, guys, okay? It's what what led people to believe that he was a military guy because um, the primary chute that you guys could see here was actually better quality. However... He might have not been familiar with it, and he said, okay, you know what, let me go with what I know. It might not mm-hmm. be as nice, but I know how to operate this. So, and you know, human beings typically like to go the path of least resistance and what they know. So, you know, I, I would, I mean, if I was in his shoes, I would go with a shoe, obviously, that I'm more familiar with versus a better one, because I know how to use the thing, The thing with the military, the military one, one it, was a, it was that it was harder to pull off yes. than the other one, because it was more, like, methodical. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. The argument is that Cooper might have been trained as, say, a paratrooper and chose the older military chute because that's the one with which he was most familiar. And there is at least one other reason to suspect that Cooper had a military background. While the flight was in a holding pattern near Seattle, Cooper mentioned that the McCord oh, Air Force Base was only 20 minutes. There you go. That's the that's military base said. we were trying to mention, yeah. yeah. Minutes away from the Seattle Tacoma Airport. At the time, that was an accurate assessment and might suggest a military background. Apart from the potential military connections, Cooper may even have had links to the Central Intelligence Agency. You see, the type of aircraft which Cooper chose to hijack, a Boeing 727, was also used by the CIA to covertly drop agents and supplies during the Vietnam War, a task for which the Boeing 727 was uniquely qualified due to its distinctive aft stairway. So it's fairly safe to assume that Cooper chose to hijack a Boeing 727 specifically because it provided a relatively safe means of escape. Whether he learned of this from the CIA or came to that conclusion independently is another question. However, the fact that Cooper chose to hijack a flight operated by Northwest Airlines was apparently random chance. When Tina Mucklow asked Cooper about his motives, he responded, It's not because I have a grudge towards your airline, it's just because I have a grudge. He further clarified that Flight 305 just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And he could have said that to maybe divert, you know, from where his, you know, his real angle, because uh, as you guys are going to see with some of the suspects, one of them definitely had a bone to pick with Northwest Airlines, um, which also, guys, do me a favor. Uh, there's 1,600 of you guys watching right now. We had 1,400 before the stream went down, which kind of sucks. I don't know where they all went. But do me a favor, guys. <laughs> like the video. Let's get to 1,000 likes. It helps with the engagement quite a bit. As you all know, this channel is somewhat shadow banned, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. So go ahead and let's get to 1,000 likes because the likes and enge- help with engagement. Engagement increases the video's power in the algorithm. The more likes, the more comments, the more engagement, the more the video gets shown to other people that can go ahead and you know enjoy the channel. We can have an army of uh, true crimers and sleuths joining under one umbrella for Fed Reacts because we are the best true crime channel on YouTube <laughs> by far. I think we're better than everybody else because we don't have to put makeup on our shit to go ahead oh, and get views. We They're give you all the bad. real sauce. All right, God damn it. So like the goddamn video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and uh, follow us on Instagram as well, at FedReacts on Instagram. Even so, it's clear that Cooper came prepared. He seemed to know a great deal about aircraft and aviation. He appeared to be familiar with the local terrain. He maintained a low profile to avoid a panic. 
He covered his eyes with a pair of glasses to conceal his identity, he left very little evidence behind, and he demanded four parachutes to force the assumption that he was taking a hostage. He was even cunning enough to reclaim the note which he'd initially given to Florence Schaffner. Uh, very smart. Apart from the name he wrote on his plane ticket, there are no other samples of Cooper's handwriting. But for all his planning and cunning, it seems Cooper did not give enough thought to his eventual escape. Not only did he fail to specify a route, but he was forced to make a last-minute destination change from Mexico City to Reno. He could have demanded more appropriate parachuting equipment like a pair of boots, a helmet, or jumpsuit. He could even have specified the ransom to be delivered in larger denominations to make it lighter and less cumbersome to carry. Presuming he did survive the fall and made it safely to the ground, he may then have had to... And real quick, guys, here are the actual um, photographs of the shoot that was given to him. You can see here the canvas bag that contained one of the parachutes given to D.B. Cooper in 1971. Oh, let me enlarge it for you real fast. Hold on. Uh, he jumped with two, including one that was used for instruction and had been sewn shut. He used the cord from one of the remaining parachutes to tie the stolen money bag shut. One of the unused parachutes requested but never used an FBI so-called Norjack case. So, um, and these are on display at the, at the FBI museum. Uh, to this day. That's crazy. Make yeah. his way through a dense, partially snow-covered forest in nothing but loafers and a trench coat in late November. I get the distinct impression that Cooper's escape was much more of a leap of faith than a carefully executed that, job. That drawing right there just On the other me. hand, just well, that scares edgy? me a lot because was drawing? That, that thing right there, like that that gift right there it's just crazy because can you imagine just jumping off a plane i just get terrified with turbulences <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it's, oh yeah that's true you I, actually do she yeah, gets sick guys in the plane I do, when they, you when get the sick every time i'm on a plane and i can't imagine a, a person i like jumping off a plane i just just can't my get my get my especially in 1970s it. like the planes weren't as nice as they are now it's cold as hell the wind is going crazy. You're, the plane's going right. 170 knots. You, you're, you know, you're ten, you're 10,000 feet above ground, so it's not as bad as jumping from a higher altitude. But regardless, like you can't see anything. It's pitch black. Yeah. You know, so and it's, it's like, windy, cold. It's and he just... doesn't even know where he's jumping out of. Like it's 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 wild that he like said, you know what, screw it, I'm just gonna jump out. So <laughs> um, it's either prison or or jumping out in the middle of nowhere. So he, I guess, he decided to jump out of nowhere. So. Because you guys could clearly see that wasn't planned because he wanted to go to Mexico City, couldn't do that. Thought about Yuma or Phoenix or any of these other places, couldn't do that. So he's like, you know what, screw it. We're on the way to Reno, I'm just going to jump out. Yeah. Authorities never received a missing persons report matching the description of Cooper in the wake of the hijacking. This might suggest that Cooper did survive and that he swiftly and quietly resumed his normal routine. Furthermore, other hijackers have performed similar stunts and many of them did survive, even if they were quickly apprehended. Finally, the simplest explanation for how three bundles of cash ended up at Tina Bar is human intervention. At the end of the day, most of this is based on nothing but supposition. Without any concrete evidence of Cooper's demise, it leaves the door wide open to the far more exciting proposition that he did, in fact, survive. I hope he did. All right, now they're going to get into the suspects. Before we get into the suspects, guys, let's go ahead and um, read some of these chats that came through. Um, we got here. Let me pull it down. Oh, yeah, you got it. D.B. Cooper, legend for avoiding that 304 flight. He could handle heists and high stakes, but not them whores. Okay, I appreciate that, sir. Uh, Angie Gaines. Oh, come on. No, we're not reading that shit. <laughs> go back, go back, go back. People, you should stop making just this lame ass things. Seriously, why would you spend ten dollars just to make a false account? Like this is why I went private on Instagram, you guys, because you guys are crazy. Like him and I just went on Reddit and read a bunch of shit you guys been writing in there, and we just we just <laughs> suddenly became paranoid of everything, like of social media. We wanted to close everything, like everything at all, because you guys are crazy. You you be clipping my my stories and like commenting on my post like my family is there you need to understand like what the hell is wrong with you stop god damn it <laughs> you got her don't mad. read that sucks to suck kim poppy Martin says the i'm hell? the number one wife don't worry you can have this seat back next week i'm keeping it warm for you i'll oh. take back my rightful spot on the controls and keys <laughs> 
And then we got here, Andy Lay, two bucks. Appreciate that. Amiri goes, I've been watching all the FNF episodes of Chronological Order since I found John January 2022. I just finished the hater called into G Check Us episode where you turn into a blood named Byron. Hey, bro, hey, Byron, I haven't seen him in a while. What happened? What, what, what Byron, is that? he's in jail. Uh, Andy <laughs> Lai, $2. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, oh, got that one. Okay. Uh, Bloody Chigger goes, I used to watch Lemino all the time. Most soothing voice on YouTube. Pause. You said sleep to it. Pause again. My old world and new world colliding. W got you, my friend. Don't worry about it. Andy Lai goes again. You should do a case on Pizzagate and Andreno Chrome. Speaking of Pizzagate, you guys need to go watch the episode that we did on the pizza bomber. That shit was lit. We spent quite a bit of time researching that one. It's probably one of my favorite ones we did too because that was a really weird case on some salt. You do Pizzagate and we get canceled on Ferry. <laughs> the what? The pizza what? The Pizzagate we get canceled immediately. I, I don't know what the Pizzagate one is. It's a theory on Jeffrey Epstein and a bunch of shit like, uh, all together. Okay, and then boys. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Myron. When will Ryan Dawson make his highly anticipated return? We will do Ryan Dawson uh, probably next week, guys. Don't worry. Um, he, he had some family stuff that he had to deal with, so that's why we couldn't do the 9-11 part two. I heard Destiny make an appearance on June 2nd. Uh, I making, didn't hear anything about making that. Making an appearance. Yeah, making an appearance. I didn't hear anything about that. Uh, just jumping on, I was getting a workout and then listening to DJ Santana. All right. Fair enough, my friend. Uh, and that's from who, Bob? Shout out to you, Bob. Uh, can you do a breakdown of 1980 Iranian embassy siege? Uh, yes, I think we can. I think there was a movie that was based on that with Ben Affleck. It was it Argo or something like that. If I'm Ooh, not mistaken. That's so good. That yeah, movie. I think it was that movie that was based on that situation. Uh, Cooper was probably one of them boys. <laughs> okay, that's from Rob. Uh, and then Darnell Elliott, Miss Mr. Gates. Oh, Miss Gaines. The the of the airbase, I think it means the airbase you mentioned was called McCord Air Force Base, okay. about 30 minutes from uh SeaTac. The Army base was Fort Lewis. I was there from 06 to 09. Oh, nice. Now known as J.B. Lewis McCord. Okay. Now, I think he said that before we pulled it up on the documentary. Okay. So Andy, for what base you, but thank about. you for that that thing. Uh, well, so we got here. Bloody Chicker goes, in English, please, Angie. All right. Okay. Uh, and what uh, goes, the TV show Prison Break touches on the theory that he hurt his leg while landing, buried the money, hit a girl with a stolen car, and went to prison. Okay. What? Uh, hey, as a prior military, you should do some other big military crimes. Also, L YouTube. Oh, don't worry, guys. We're back. I, I figured it. YouTube might do that, so we're back. I, I, I was prepared. And again, guys, whenever it's stream uh, suspended, when we put it back on the playback, it's going to show that part that was suspended. So don't worry. I got y'all. Yeah. I always put that in the timestamps as well. Uh, what else? Caught up? Yep. All right, cool. So we're going to go ahead, guys, and go into the suspects, and then we'll go into the other theory of what they think potentially could have happened. By the time the press got wind of the hijacking, the FBI had already begun to investigate a few potential suspects. Among them was a man in Portland with initials DB and surname Cooper. This Cooper was quickly eliminated as a suspect. Yeah, it wasn't that easy, FBI. Come on, man. <laughs> but due to a mix-up by the press, the name Dan Cooper was confused for DB Cooper, and the rest is history. Yeah, so basically a reporter that didn't pay attention to detail, guys, put D.B. Cooper in the press release, and the name just stuck because it sounded a lot cooler than Dan Cooper. Uh, nowhere in the investigation did they use the term D.B. Cooper. It's just a reporter that put it that way, and then bam, they said, you know what, that's the moniker, we're going to stick with it. It is what it is. Yep. While Dan Cooper is most likely a pseudonym, there is a comic book series of the same name. The comic is written in French and centers around a Canadian pilot named Dan Cooper. While the comic was not translated into English nor sold in the United States before 1971, it was available in Canada, which has a large French-speaking population. Given that American and Canadian accents can be difficult to distinguish, besides certain terms like I told y'all before, like a boot and stuff like that, this is what leads people to suspect that um, Cooper was potentially Canadian and or had ties to Canada because this comic book was not in the United States prior to 1971 and it was written in French only. It's possible that Cooper, who was described as having no discernible accent, was a bilingual Canadian. This might even be supported by something that Cooper might have said. Before we get into that, guys, do me a favor. We only got 835 likes yet. We got 1,100 plus you guys in here. Smash that like button, subscribe to the channel because as y'all can see, YouTube is trying to throttle us in the algorithm, hating on the stream. So like the video, guys. Let's get the, get it up in the algorithm so more people can find this type of content because this is going to be the best D.B. Cooper breakdown on YouTube because we're showing y'all all angles. Yes, sir. You see, when the captain relayed Cooper's demands to air traffic control, he used the phrase negotiable American currency. 
it seems doubtful that an American citizen would specify American currency. So perhaps Cooper won. Yeah, I'll tell you this. Uh, Jamal ain't robbing a bank and say, hey, I need negotiable denominations of U.S. currency right now, okay? <laughs> or else you're going to get the crap. So, yeah, definitely some type of shit that a foreigner would say. Us North American. The problem is we don't know if this is a direct quote from Cooper or paraphrasing by the captain. For instance, notes taken by the crew during the hijacking merely contain the phrase negotiable currency, while testimonies provided by the crew after the hijacking include phrases like $200,000 in cash and circulated U.S. currency. See, so, he he Cooper might dollars. have been Canadian, and he might have taken his name from the Dan Cooper comics, just as he might have been American, and might have taken his name from something or someone else. Nearly half a century has gone by since the hijacking took place, and in that time, thousands of suspects have been questioned and investigated. It would obviously be impossible to cover all of them here, but let's take a look at some of the people that at some point or another have been suspected of being D.B. Cooper. And these are pretty much all the top suspects in the investigation, guys, that we're going to go through. Um, so, and I think some of you guys actually mentioned some of their names uh, earlier in the chat. Some of y'all said McCoy, etc. So let's see what could have implicated them and what actually ended up exonerating them. Robert Rackstraw first became a suspect in 1978, and on the surface, he seems like a solid candidate. He was a decorated army paratrooper and helicopter pilot. He had experience with explosives. He had an extensive criminal record. He had an uncle named John Cooper, who was an avid skydiver. He was expelled from the army only months before the hijacking, which might suggest a motive. After all, the hijacker did say he had a grudge. When confronted by journalists and private investigators, Rackstraw would neither confirm nor outright deny that he was D.B. Cooper. Instead, he'd say things like, I could have been, or I would not discount myself. On the other hand, Rackstraw had light-colored eyes, which Cooper did not. More significantly, Rackstraw was only 28 years of age at the time of the hijacking. This is well outside the range of ages reported by the crew and passengers, most of whom believed Cooper was in his mid-40s. Kenneth Christensen first became a suspect in 2003 when his brother noticed certain parallels between him and Cooper. Christensen had briefly served as He does look like him quite a bit though from that photo. as a paratrooper in World War II, and since 1953 he'd worked for Northwest Airlines as both a mechanic and a flight attendant. He was 45 years old at the time of the hijacking. He was left-handed, which Cooper might have been. For instance, Cooper used his left hand to interact with his briefcase, and the clip-on tie he left on board was affixed with a tie clasp applied from the left. Shortly before he died in 1994, Christensen had supposedly told his brother, there is something you should know, but I cannot tell you. After his passing, his family discovered over $200,000 in his bank accounts. To top it all off, Florence Schaffner stated that photographs of Christensen bore a strong resemblance to Cooper. On the other hand, Christensen did not match the physical description of Cooper. He was both shorter and lighter. While Schaffner did see a strong resemblance, she remarked that Cooper had more hair, and that is supported by the composite sketches. And there was nothing suspicious about the large sums of money which he'd simply earned by selling land. But Guys, I will say this, right after the hijacking, uh, and I think December of 1971 or so, people did see that he had a big amount of money, around $200,000 uh, in his bank account. And also he bought a house cash, guys, right after that hijacking. And he was mad because the airline, right, kept getting strikes uh, given after them, right? Um, the uh, North Northwest Airline, they kept getting strikes given to them and that fucked his, fucked his ability up to basically work and make money. So he was pissed off and he had to do odd jobs like div digging ditches, etc., to make ends meet. So he definitely had a bone to pick with the airline. Um, and he was only earning about $150 a week back then in 1971. So for him to save yeah. up almost $200,000 in cash and buy a home cash, um, highly improbable, especially the way he was able to do it so quickly. And if you guys see from the photos, he looks a lot like him. Let's go back real quick. I'll show y'all. $150 back then was $1,100. $1,100. $1,100. So, look, I mean, look at the resemblance here. He, I would say, by far, looks Two. the most and like since 1950, D.B. Cooper. Had briefly served Hold on. 
became a suspect in 2003 when his brother noted. And also, guys, he know he knew um, the routes very well, and he knew about the airplanes very well as well. So, um, you know, the way that he was able to strategize and everything else like that was very telling of someone that could have potentially worked for this company. Also, the ones that ended up paying that 200k, I think it was the airline themselves that paid that 200,000. How would he have known that they would have that money ready to go? I don't know. You know, so there's a lot of coincidences there. The thing with him is that everyone that saw actually saw D.B. Cooper rule him out. No, no, no. It was the next guy that they're going to rule out, not him. They they say that he actually looked the most like D.B. Cooper. But he, this guy. Okay. You're going to see the I think the next. You're thinking of the next guy that they're going to rule out that he didn't look like. Or no. Yeah, uh, the I next guy. Was, the next guy didn't sure? look like him. You'll see because here of the second. of the of the edges here. Yeah, they said that, that like the, they remember Cooper having more hair, but he definitely yeah. has the most uh, the face that looks the most. I mean, hell, look at the pictures, guys. So, um, but we'll see here in a second. This brain and a flight attendant. He was forty-five. That Cooper used his left hand. Oh, and then the thing also, this guy was about five foot eight, and they had DV Cooper at about five foot ten to six foot. That was another thing that they said. Hey, we don't know if that's him. Flight from the left. Shortly before he died in 1994, tell you. After his passing, his family discovered over $200,000 in his bank accounts. To top it all off, Florence Schaffner stated that photographs of Christensen bore a strong resemblance to Cooper. On the other hand, Christensen did not match the physical description of Cooper. He was both shorter and lighter. While Schaffner did see a strong resemblance, she remarked that Cooper had more hair and that is supported by the composite sketches. Yeah, so he did have a strong resemblance from the witnesses, but just the hair is the only thing that was off. And there was nothing suspicious about the large sums of money which he'd simply earned by selling land. Richard McCoy first became a suspect in 1972 when he hijacked a Boeing 727 and escaped via the aft stairway, much like D.B. Cooper. Because of the Copy significant that. overlap between the two hijackings, this is a guy that was very favored to be the, uh, yeah. the DB Cooper. Some believe they must have been committed by the same person. McCoy used a fake name. He used a fake hand grenade to threaten the crew. He used handwritten notes to issue his demands. Both McCoy and Cooper used the phrase no funny stuff as a warning to the crew. McCoy demanded $500,000 in cash and four parachutes. McCoy also bailed out the back of the plane once they passed over his hometown in the state of Utah. Apart from the similar modus operandi, McCoy had also served in the Vietnam War as a demolitions expert and a helicopter pilot. McCoy did actually survive the fall and managed to evade authorities for two full days before he was apprehended and sentenced oh to 45 years in prison. Before his death in 1974, McCoy refused to confirm or deny that he was D.B. Cooper. On the other hand, McCoy was an avid recreational skydiver and even came prepared with a skydiving helmet and jumpsuit. He gave very specific instructions about the flight path. In addition to the fake hand grenade, McCoy also used an unloaded handgun to threaten the crew. He failed to retrieve one of the notes he'd given to a flight attendant. He was only 29 years of age at the time of the hijacking, and all three flight attendants were quite certain that McCoy was not Cooper. Yeah, so th they basically said, no, that's not him. He doesn't look like him at all. Mm -hmm. While there are meaningful parallels between these two cases, McCoy might simply have been a copycat who'd read about D.B. Cooper in the news. And I think that's the most plausible uh, explanation. Yeah. I mean, he didn't even, he didn't even like deny it. Like, so you could already tell, oh yeah, clout, I want the clout, fuck it. Because mm -hmm. this was a huge story back then, guys. Wayne Weber first became a suspect in 1995 when, shortly before his death, he supposedly told his wife, I've got a secret to tell you. I am Dan Cooper. Following his deathbed oh, here we go, another one. confession, Weber's widow recalled a number of fascinating details. She claims to have found a bank bag resembling the one used in the hijacking. She claims Weber had sustained a knee injury after jumping out of a plane. Weber supposedly had a nightmare about leaving his fingerprints on the aft stairs. And a year before the money was discovered at Tina Bar, Weber had allegedly paid a quick visit to the same location. In addition, Weber was a World War II veteran, he had an extensive criminal record, he matched the physical description, and he was 47 years old in 1971. On the other hand, Weber's fingerprints did not match any of the prints collected from Flight 305. Although, to be fair, there's no way to know if any of those prints actually belonged to Cooper. 
Furthermore, Weber's DNA did not match a DNA sample collected from the tie clasp. But once again, there's no way to know if the DNA on the tie clasp actually came from the hijacker and not someone else. What's so frustrating is that the FBI likely had a much better source of DNA at one point. If you recall, eight cigarette butts were collected from the scene and there's a good chance they were all suffused with Cooper's DNA. The problem is, that evidence was lost at some point oh, and it's not turned out. Oh, man. Shout out to the FBI now getting to be called for the rest of this podcast as the LBI. God LBI. fucking damn, bro. Boom, oh God. And they would have definitely been able to go ahead and use that DNA and potentially find out who he is. At least they would have had a legit DNA profile of the the um, hijacker, man, and they fucking lost it. Uh, Department of Justice goes, uh, yeah, I lost my ass. <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> LBI. The FBI is crying in the chat. Yeah. William Smith first became a suspect in 2018. Smith served in the Navy during World War II and likely had some experience with parachuting. He was 43 years old at the time of the high. <laughs> what the? Do <laughs> put Lost Bureau of Investigation. Down the Mongo. Now that's fucking funny. Yo, Lost Bureau of Investigation. What the fuck, bro? <laughs> Jacking, he had dark brown eyes, he matched the physical description, he shared a certain likeness with the composite sketches. Even the FBI finds that shit funny. <laughs> <laughs> and the Department of Justice, oh my god. Especially this speculative sketch of an older D.B. Cooper, a student named Ira Daniel Cooper who was killed in World War II. Like the fucking video, guys. I only see 878 likes, but we're getting all these fucking laughs over here. Guys, like the video, subscribe to the channel, man, if you haven't already. But at least like the video. Let's get this thing to 1,000 likes, man, so I can stop asking, goddammit. <laughs> Attended the same high school as Smith. Smith worked as a yardmaster for a railroad company for most of his life, but in 1970, the company filed for bankruptcy. As a consequence, Smith lost his pension, which might suggest a motive. He could, for instance, have developed a grudge towards the airline industry for their role in bringing about the downfall of the rail transportation industry. It's further speculated that Smith could have used his knowledge of railroad networks to hop on a train and escape undetected. On the other hand, Smith spent his entire life in the northeastern United States. Given that the hijacking occurred on the other side of the country and was committed by someone who at least appeared to be familiar with the local terrain, Smith is not the most ideal candidate. However, the fact that Smith worked as a yardmaster is interesting. You see, the tie that Cooper left behind was recently examined using an electron microscope, which uncovered various metallic particles. Oh, the Some of these material. particles, especially yeah, yeah, very interesting. pure titanium, were quite rare in 1971. This might suggest that Cooper worked as a manager at some sort of chemical or metallurgical facility, or possibly a rail yard. Also, they knew that the tie came from J.C. Penney because J.C. Penney was the only place, I think, from the 1960s up until the early 1970s that carried that clip on tie. So uh, that's another little link there as well. If nothing else, I hope this limited selection of suspects illustrates just how difficult it is to be certain when you have so little evidence to work with. These five individuals look nothing alike, yet any one of them could be D.B. Cooper. Was Cooper really in his mid-40s or did he simply look old for his age? Did Cooper really serve in the military? Which one of these sketches most closely resemble Cooper? In 2016, the FBI had to admit defeat and officially close down the case. And this is uh, their official statement. It goes, update on investigation of 1971 hijacking by D.B. Cooper. Also, just so you guys know, as far as the cigarette butts go, back in 1971, there was no DNA, guys. So they probably didn't take it as seriously back in the 70s because they were like, what the hell is DNA going to do? You know what I mean? They didn't yeah. even know what it was, really. So DNA didn't become a thing, guys, until damn near the 90s into the 2000s. That's how they were able to catch the Golden State Killer and BTK um, because DNA technology really wasn't used in, court, in the court system until I think the first official prosecution was sometime in the late 80s or 90s, and then they didn't actually streamline using DNA and in criminal investigations until the 2000s. So, you know, in 1971, 
FBI agents back then, you know, for fucking live, uh, living under a rock, not understanding the power of DNA in the future. Uh, but here's their statement that they gave. Update our investigation on 1971 hijacking by D.B. Cooper. Quote, following one of the longest and most exhaustive investigations in our history, on July 8, 2016, the FBI redirected resources allocated to the D.B. Co- Cooper case in order to focus on other investigative priorities. Uh, priorities. During the course of the 45-year Norjack investigation, the FBI exhaustively reviewed all credible leads, coordinated between multiple field offices to conduct searches, collected all available evidence, and interviewed all identified witnesses. Over the years, the FBI has applied numerous new and innovative investigative techniques as well as examined countless items at the FBI laboratory. Evidence obtained during the course of the investigation will now be preserved for historical purposes at the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. That's a fancy way of saying... Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know, Mara, but, uh, well, you, you might know, but uh, I read somewhere or I saw in any of, the, of these documentaries that even though the FBI closed the, the investigation, uh, D.B. Cooper to this day, if they find it, like, if they find it, find him, um, he can be prosecuted. And I think that has a name for the FBI, but I don't know what it is. Oh, really? Yeah. He can still be prosecuted to this day. Yeah. Maybe. Even, even though the FBI closed the investigation. Okay. It has a name, but I just don't remember what it's C- called. Can you look it up real quick? I mean, sure. uh, I mean, there's always a statute of limitations, but I guess maybe because uh, there is, I think, an air piracy statute on the books that doesn't have a statute of limitations. And actually declassified, uh, I think the law might have come in uh, after the fact um, from a case that I watched on declassified. So, um, yeah, y'all like that angle? You can see us right there going hard in the paint on, on the kickout cam. Uh, and you can see Angie over there doing what she does as well. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead. Um, so <clears throat> let me go back to the documentary. And then we're going to go into the death theory here, guys, next. Unless someone stumbles upon Cooper's remains or manages to track down the rest of the money, it seems there is little hope of resolution. Did Cooper survive? I have no idea. But as long as that possibility cannot be dismissed, the legend of D.B. Cooper will no doubt persist. And shout out to Lemonito, bro. Great video. Great breakdown that you did. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and look at a um, National Geographic documentary that goes into the theory, guys, of him potentially dying. Before I do that, though, um, here is from the official FBI website, by the way, as well. Uh, scientists hunt for D.B. Cooper clues. D.B. Cooper, 1971, has a wild scheme to jump. Out- like the video, guys. 1,200 y'all in here, man. We should be at 1,000 likes easy. Out of the back of an airplane at 10,000 feet in the middle of the night in a rainstorm over unknown territory. The guy either had to be crazy or brilliant and have mad skills. Right at the spot we're standing here, we've calculated that this is the precise location that Brian Ingram, when he was eight years of age, scooped across the sand with his arm and uncovered the three bundles of bills, which have been the only Cooper cash ever recovered from that hijacking event in 1971. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a great mystery. You know, what happened to this guy? The- All right, this guy, Larry Carr, is the case agent, guys, um, now. He's probably the one that closed the case. Um, oh, he was the lead agent. The, the, he was the lead. He's the modern lead agent. He, the, he was the lead investiga- investigator yes. agent. Yeah, but he For wasn't the, case. the original case agent. He inherited this case from the 70s. Oh, this okay. dude. Yeah, this dude. I, I, let me find the actual original case agent for y'all because he has more details. Last thing we knew is he had two hundred thousand dollars and uh, bailed out of the back of a seven twenty seven, uh, November November twenty fourth, nineteen seventy one, uh, and then from there we don't know if we can find resolution to the case without allocating resources, without sending FBI manpower to the investigation, but come up with an answer. Then why wouldn't we do that? We have with us a team of people that have all volunteered their time, their money, and their effort to come try and solve this, just purely for the excitement of doing it. Right now we're on Tina Bar. We're looking at the location where the money was found. Tomorrow we're going to be heading off to look at unpublished photos from the Oregonian newspaper, which could tell us exactly what was going on here at that time. And then at the end of the week, we're heading up to Seattle to meet with Special Agent Larry Carr to look at the FBI archive. Right now we're in the Little Washougal River, which is east of the flight path of D.B. Cooper and where they think he potentially jumped out. We're here because the Little Washougal River and the Washougal River are the biggest rivers in the area that are capable of moving a wad of money like this downstream. So it's thought that his money fell into one of these two rivers, went downstream, hit the Columbia River, and then moved further south on the Columbia River toward the ocean until it showed up on Tina Bar. We're out here making a campfire, my father and I. 
that's when we went to There's a kid that found the money. I think he was eight or nine years old back then. Uh, but obviously now he's an adult. Because uh, uh, I think this video was shot somewhere. I probably think he was like, 10. He was, yeah. 10. So this is almost 20 years, well, well over 20 years later. Discovered. Uh, discovered. His thing. dad tried to take that credit, though. Now, it wasn't you, bro. It was him. Three packets of $20 uh -huh. bills. Well, later to be proven as ransom money of D.B. Cooper. We're throwing a lot of technology at these Cooper bills and trying to figure out the history, what caused them to degrade, what degradation components have been mixed in with them, and does this tell us something about where these Cooper bills have been? It's got a pack of of uh, bills on there, I'm trying to find out how buoyant it is, and, and as far as what's the distance it's going to travel. Uh, we've seen find its location right here, where it seems like it's wanting to come right back to us, and it happens to be right at the spot that I found the money, um, 1980. Why am I so interested in D.B. Cooper? Who isn't interested in D.B. Cooper after hearing? Um, a All right. Women deserve less. Who cares what she got to say? All right. So now we're going to get into uh, <laughs> this was the case agent right here, guys. The original uh, Ralph Hemmelsbach. I can't find the dang team. Retired FBI Special Agent Ralph Hemmelsbach was one of the first agents to respond to the D.B. Cooper hijacking at Portland International Airport in 1971. And you always want to talk to the original case agents, guys, because they're the ones that are going to have the most piss of vinegar to solve the case versus someone that inherits the case later on. Hemmelsbach continued to pursue leads for the rest of his career, becoming the public face of the FBI's investigation. The D.B. Cooper case had a bigger impact on my life than any other single case I've ever had. When you had heard what his demands were, that he asked for four parachutes and $200,000, was there anything in your mind thinking about who this guy might be? No. Uh, my initial uh, reaction was, uh, you look for criminals, you know, because a guy doesn't live his whole life as a law-abiding citizen, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, threatened to kill over 40 people and uh, uh, himself. Is there any... Just so you guys know, um, and again, this is History Channel, so we got to be careful here. Um, the plane was not packed. If I'm not mistaken, it was only one oh, to, one or two, one or two, three quarters. Uh, it was 37 packed. passengers. 37? And six people of the crew. Okay, so but how much did that plane hold? Like 200 seats or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so it was damn near empty. Uh, and remember, he flew. He was flying the day before Thanksgiving, so you know that's not a typical day that you wanna uh, you wanna travel. So he was smart to pick a certain day when he knew that the there wouldn't be the most people on board. Oh, you see, and people will come. There'd be back. a skeleton crew. What was that? People will go to home for for the for the Thanksgiving, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't want to fly on the day before Thanksgiving. That sucks. Mm. You know, you Facts. typically want to be there a, a couple days prior. Anybody out there that you think this is the guy, but. No. You no. weren't able to pin anything no. on him? No, no. If I had gotten that close to where I was convinced on duty or off, I'd still be looking because no person should be able to profit from a criminal activity. And one thing that Mr. Hoover always reminded us was that you don't arrive at a conclusion without the facts. You know, and that's not as easy to do, uh, not just for investigators, but if you're. And yeah, J. Edgar Hoover was the first director of the FBI. So you, that tells you guys that this dude was probably in the bureau, like right at the beginning. So he's an old, <laughs> old school FBI agent way back in the day, man. Not like today where it's all bureaucratic, right? The bureau nowadays, man, is super bureaucratic, man. A lot of red tape. It's very difficult for them to get their job done. A good friend of mine actually is still an FBI agent to this day. And uh, it's really tough for them to do shit, guys, because it's such a political thing nowadays uh versus you know that's one thing i liked about hsi is like we were just out there running and gunning and doing what the fuck we got to do because it's a relatively new agency so we don't have all this red tape in the way of getting shit done but the bureau bro you know it's the you know they they have a lot we have a lot of funny nicknames for them uh you know famous but incompetent um call oh them the my phoebes. god <laughs> yeah <laughs> call, call them the phoebes uh as we used to call them, yeah the, you call a lot of people call them the bureau uh, you know, the federal bureau of uh, federal bureaucratic idiots, you know, like there's a whole bunch of, um, names or, or famous, but idiots. There's so many different acronyms that other agencies say, 
uh, to make fun of the bureau, man. The supervisor, if you're the head of the office, right? You know, everybody up the chain has to guard for that. It's very easy to fall yes. prey to. Aha! That's, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no cancel. real aha yeah. moment yeah. early in a case right. like that. Right. Were you thinking we're going to find his body somewhere sooner or later? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. That's what you're hoping. <laughs> I, I'd rather believe that he is dead. If he wasn't dead and if he was alive right now and you met him, what would you say to him? Freeze, you're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. FBI, open up! It never ends. Be older than him, That's probably. funny as hell, bro. <laughs> My man is barely walking. Freeze! You're under arrest. <laughs> Jimmy Cooper right now must be dead. Yeah, he's yeah. Dead. I doubt he's, yeah. he's If he's, he's alive old. now, he'd be around 98 years old or something yeah, like that. Old. So, um, okay. So let's go ahead, guys, and go into the death theory. And actually, um, those scientists that y'all saw when we were um, covering, uh, when we were showing you the FBI version, that's where that, those clips came from, actually. So we're going to go to the National Geographic one. So we got to be careful here because uh, National Geographic are losers. So I'm going to pause this thing quite a bit um, so that we go ahead and um, you know make sure we don't get hit with the stream, whatever. But before I do that, real quick, I need like y'all to like the video because right now I'm looking. We got, let's see how many of y'all. We got uh, 948 likes, but there's 1,200, almost 1,300 you guys watching right now. So I need y'all to get me to one thousand likes okay guys i really don't want to stop the show i hate doing that shit but you guys have been you know one of them boys you know what i mean when it comes to giving the likes out listen it's not a dollar i'm not asking you guys for money i'm only asking you guys to like the video because i already know this thing is going to get throttled by the algorithm because we had a stream suspended bullshit and uh you know we're fresh and fit in general is shadow banned but like the goddamn video guys subscribe to the channel and fat and follow fat reacts on instagram Yes, follow FedReacts on Instagram. <laughs> Angie manages that. So, um, so yeah. So let's go ahead and get this thing. Uh, let's get the show on the road, as DB Cooper would say. So we're gonna go into the theory, guys, of why he may have not survived. Believes the three bundles of ransom money provide the best clue to solving Cooper's fate. Apart from the $5,800 found on the riverbank, none of the other bills were ever found in circulation. Tom is convinced that the bag of money, all $200,000 of it, must have traveled by river to where the three stacks of money were found. The three bundles couldn't have traveled independently, yet ended up in the same place on the sandbar. What's so funny, Angie? You're over here dying. What's going on? It's the shadow. The chat, what'd they say? Shadow band. Fresh is a shadow. <laughs> fresh shadow band. What? Here. <laughs> shadow band, nigga, fresh is a shadow. <laughs> oh, oh man. <laughs> uh, you guys are fucking hilarious, man. Y'all got no chill in the chat, man. <laughs> this tells us that the bank bag was involved in the transport. It could have split open close to the sandbar, thereby increasing the odds that three out of the hundred bundles of cash would have ended up together in the same place. If the bank bag ended up in the river, then whatever happened to Cooper, the money he risked his life to steal was never spent. But how exactly did the bag of money end up in the water? Okay, guys, so we're going to get into the theory now of how the money ended up there and um, the facts and circumstances based on the scientists of what potentially could have led to uh, D.B. Cooper's death. All right, guys, so, um, and again, like I said before, this is just one theory, guys. There's a bunch of th theories out there. If you guys watch the Netflix documentary, I think, uh, what was his name? Tom Colbert, if I'm not mistaken. He's the head of a cold case. Uh, they spent a decade plus on this, and they're pretty much, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're almost certain that it's Rackstraw that was D.B. Cooper. So there's a million different theories on this, and this is just one of them as to how he potentially didn't survive. Tom examines the flight path and timing of the jump, recorded at approximately 8.10.
At this point, he's directly over the Lewis River. If the bank bag, which was being flailed by 200 mile an hour winds, detached from Cooper, it would have fallen directly below into the Lewis River. The Lewis River is around 300 feet wide with a fast current and rapids. So that is a theory that potentially, guys, the bag, right? Because remember, he was trying to affix the bag to himself, right? Uh, before he jumped out. It is possible with all those winds and him flying all over the place, right? Uh, that the bag could have fell off of him and fell into the river and, you know, he would have been mad as hell. Or maybe some of the money would have fallen out and he was able to secure it before the rest of it fell out. And that's why that money ended up there. So that's another potential situation. It's possible that the money bag could make its way downstream. But Dan Cooper was protecting the money with his life. And with 30 feet of parachute cord, could have secured the bag. If Cooper did secure the bag and managed to deploy his chute, where would he have landed? Okay, so this is where stuff is gonna get interesting here, guys, because remember, uh, we talked about this as well, guys, uh, that Unfortunately, the military parachute that he chose uh, doesn't allow you to maneuver and steer like the other luxury citizen one or sports parachute that he chose to leave behind. So um, you would have been at the mercy of the wind at that point, which we know it was pretty damn cold and windy that night. So let's get back to it. His chosen parachute, the NB-8, unlike the sports chute, is not maneuverable. It would take him wherever the winds blew. Tom K believes that whatever altitude Cooper deployed, the westerly winds would carry him directly to his worst nightmare. Water. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> and I want you guys to picture this. You fall into the water the day before Thanksgiving, being in the Pacific Northwest, which is cold as fuck, by the way. It was below zero that night, guys. So it would have been freezing. And all you got on is a trench coat, a suit, maybe some long johns underneath your suit, right? <laughs> uh, because he was planning to jump out. But it is cold as hell, guys. We're talking hypothermia type temperature. From our calculations, we can determine that if Cooper pulled his parachute right away, he would have had a long drift and likely ended up in Lake Merwin. If he waited and pulled a couple thousand feet above the ground, he would have ended up in the Lewis River. Lake Merwin is a huge dam, which spills directly into the Lewis River. The low cloud cover and the non-maneuverable parachute would have given Cooper little, if any, chance of changing course with near freezing temperatures the water would have been cold cold enough to kill so real quick before we go into uh how he would have had to been able to survive this if he um actually landed in the water i need you guys to do me a favor well number one we're watching national geographic so you already know that they're going to be on some lame shit like oh we're copyright blah 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 so like the video. I see that we got 1K likes, which I really appreciate that. But there's 1,300 of you guys watching right now. So if we could get 100% engagement and get 1,300 likes, I would really appreciate that. I need you guys to not be one of these ninja watchers that sits there on YouTube fucking like this. Because this is half of y'all that watch the goddamn show. Just literally sitting there like. What the hell? I need y'all to hit the fucking like button, show your goddamn support, because content like this, you ain't going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to have a former Fed with actual experience giving y'all sauce on how these investigations are done, giving you guys some commentary. I mean, goddamn it, look at Angie's notes, goddamn it. She worked really hard on this for y'all. <laughs> show them that notebook. Show it to them, woman, so they know yeah. that you are, you're not, not out here drawings? just being a pretty face. Look at that, man. She out here drawing suits. And trench coats for y'all. The plane. <laughs> what, what, so show them another page of notes that you had with the, oh, with, I, I with drew, the parachutes. I drew the, the dynamite too. 
She drew the dynamite. Yeah. Like, come on, guys. No He's, security. She's taking notes. Yeah, English is her second language. <laughs> Show them the the, the parachute. The uh, parachute things. shit. Yeah, the pictures okay, that you here. took. Look at that, man. We work hard over here for y'all. Okay, man. That's how we act. Sorry. Down the Marco. Okay. Like the goddamn video. We should be 1,300 likes easy. We're at 1,100. We should be 1,300 easy, man. She ain't just a pretty face out here, you know, oh, I'm going to talk and give some commentary. No, man. <laughs> she really be out here researching for y'all, bro. Matter is of that, fact. Wait, hang on. Is that your impression of my accent? Pretty much. It's terrible. Oh, my but, God. But, uh, yeah, man. So, like the goddamn video, man. She be, she be out here, like, helping out for real. Um, Her and Kim, like, really go hard behind the scenes, guys, to research stuff. A lot of the times I'll be like, hey, uh, what do the people want? She'll give me a list of the cases. I'm like, all right, let's hit this one. Um, DB Cooper, was it your idea to do this one this week, or was it Kim's? I wanted to do it. Yeah. You know. So there you go, man. Y'all are getting this show right now because uh, because of her, man. So go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and uh, let's go ahead and hit 1,300 on this thing, man. Let's get 100% engagement. We are risking right now getting the stream shut down because we're playing National Geographic shit. If we're gonna take these risks, that's fine, right? Some of these videos don't even get monetized, to be honest with y'all. I don't care about that shit. My goal isn't to sit here and make money off of this channel. That's not really our goal here. Our goal is to give y'all entertainment, sauce, and diversify and show you guys that we're, you know, we're not a one-trick pony over here at Fresh and Fit. We can give you guys everything. So um, the only thing we ask, guys, for all the hard work and research is to like the video. That's all we ask, man. Y'all see Angie over here putting work behind the scenes. She's not just here to just give some commentary. She really does study these cases and enjoy doing it and helping you guys I really, out. I really love doing this, to yeah. be honest with you guys. So, so, yeah, like the video. Like the video, please. When D.B. Cooper hit the water, like we believe he did, he would have only had a matter of minutes in that type of cold water to get off on shore at that point. Remember, he was laden with 20 pounds of money. He had a harness and he had a long parachute attached to him at this point. So we think that his odds of survival would have been very low. He used the poorer choice of equipment. The conditions were horrible. And the fact that we haven't found anything really leads me to believe that he died that night. So that's debatable. We know that there was a citizen type parachute, sports parachute, and a military one. He chose the military one because uh, more than likely, he probably was military trained and he would have been, he would have preferred to use equipment that he understands and knows. So it's not necessarily a poor choice of equipment. It's uh, just equipment that might have not been as good. But hey, what's better? Equipment that you're familiar with and know how to operate or equipment that's slightly better, but you're not familiar with? I always go with what you're familiar with. Yeah. Also, uh, I don't know if they mentioned this in here, but uh, the the lady that handed the parachutes to, to D.B. Cooper, they actually came with instructions. Oh, yes. Good point. They, uh, they yeah. came with instructions, and he said that they, they wouldn't need them. He wouldn't need them. Mm -hmm. Why did you put that camera oh, on? Oh, yeah. Switch it up, man. Switch it up. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. so right. So <laughs> you don't got to look at the camera. <laughs> you, you get a song. It's fine. <laughs> he came with instructions, and he said that he, they, he wouldn't need them. So, that also Yeah, that also was that. very, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, he basically was like, I don't I don't need any of that. That so. camera is so weird, but I took it off. <laughs> No, just because they're never going to keep like it on. the back part of the studio and everything. <laughs> hey, y'all like that? Yo, like the goddamn video, man. We go hard to pay for y'all, man. Y'all see that setup, man. We go hard to fucking paint over here, man. Uh, okay. So, yeah, that also was a big thing, too, because he didn't say he needed the instructions, guys. He was very dismissive when they gave it to him. Body yeah. would have moved down the fast-running river some 20 miles to the Columbia. The three bundles of ransom cash were found just a few miles from where the Lewis and Columbia rivers meet. But there's a catch. These few miles are upriver against its natural flow. Tom Kay offers a rational explanation. At the time, the Columbia River was one of the busiest shipping lanes in North America. We believe it's possible that Cooper's body and the money became snagged up on one of these ships' propellers and it moved upstream with the ship. At some point, the violence of this ripped open the bank bag and spilled out the money. So I'm going to go ahead and do a poll here with you guys, okay? Do you guys think 
DB Cooper survived. Hold on. We'll, I'll have you give your theory last, Angie. Let me um, okay. get, ask the community here, though. I'm putting a poll up right now for y'all. I want to know what you guys think. Poll's up right now. Do you guys think DB Cooper survived this jump? Yes or no? And I'll end the poll at the end of the show. You know show. what? I'm going to make a poll on Instagram, too. On Instagram, too? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, good, good move. Good move. Uh, so... I want to see what y'all think because now you guys are seeing kind of both perspectives here, right? You saw, you've seen the suspects, you've seen the evidence in the case, even though there's not much of it. You've seen what his request, his demands, you've seen the notes, you've seen the ticket. Uh, you know what he was wearing that night. You know the date, what the conditions were. With all these facts, yeah. do you guys think he survived? Okay. Play the last part of this bit here. Three of the hundred bundles subsequently found their way onto the shore before being covered by the shifting sands. But if this is true, what happened to Cooper's body? All right, real quick before we get into this, guys, we only got one, 1,100 likes, okay? We're playing National Geographic here. These guys are probably going to come in and cock block because they're haters, okay? Because they're stupid. So I need y'all to like the video. Hey, well, this is going to be hit hey, 1300. Let's get 1300 likes. So we hit 100 uh, percent engagement. Go ahead, Angie. Um, so I know Martin is not going to like this, but because uh, I am a very fan of Marvel and I actually believe Loki might have been D.B. Cooper. I'm going to put that option on the poll, you guys. So what do you guys think? What? If you actually watch the Loki series or you know anything about Marvel, you'll know what I'm talking about. Marlon, you probably don't uh, know. On because... Instagram? Yeah, on Instagram. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so... Yeah, guys, let's get to 100% engagement, goddammit. We need 100% engagement. We need what 1,300 likes on this thing. Let's make <laughs> Angie uncomfortable with this camera angle, goddammit. So no. go ahead and like the video right like now it. and subscribe to the goddamn channel if you haven't already, all right? This is camera eight. This is the kickout cam, actually. It's so weird. <laughs> so go ahead. Y'all see that right there? I got the little kick. Well, we're not kicking anybody out in this situation, but you guys get the point. God Hang damn on. It. Is that the camera that you guys put? So when you kick out somebody on the, on the yeah, phone? we put the little boot on the side. The, the, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like the video guys. All right. Yeah. We've looked and the polls up on Instagram for the people. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what potentially happened to DB Cooper's body. Like the video guys, 1300 likes. Let's get it. The currents. And these tell us that within a few days, the Columbia River is going to suck up your body and spit it out into the ocean. So D.B. Cooper may be at the bottom of the ocean at this point, and we would never, ever be able to come up with his body. After nearly four decades, Tom Kay offers the first comprehensive theory of what might have happened to Dan Cooper. But dead or alive, the identity of the hijacker remains a mystery. All right, bam. So uh, that is the theory, guys, with um, with D.B. Cooper. Uh, that's the theory that he might have not survived. A lot of people think that he did survive. I'm looking at the poll right now. It looks like 68% of you guys think D.B. Cooper survived, um, which is, oh, that's interesting. Um, Angie, what are your, you want to give your thoughts uh, yeah, on what, I, what, do you, what do you think here? I have my own theories. I think uh, somebody, I, I have like one theory that is maybe somebody might have a boat waiting for him on any of the lakes. Well, on, on the main thing, like the, the lake thing. Or the lady, the stewards, the, is this the steward, the word that you say? Yeah, the stewardess, yeah. Yeah. Flight attendant. She, yeah, the flight attendant was helping him. Uh -huh. I, I heavily believe that. I believe that maybe not the first one, but was like it? the second one, T uh, Tina Moklo might have helped him and she kept like, a part of the money okay i think that interesting yeah. interesting uh yeah i mean from all the planning that he had done it sounded a little weird that he would like maybe his intention was to jump out in that area the whole time and he just told them to go to new mexico or sorry to go to um mexico to mexico as as a diversion so who knows um but regardless uh it seems like uh okay it looks like 69 percent of you guys looking at the poll here think he survived 31 percent of you guys think he passed away um, but yeah, it was a rough night that night as well. You know well, what? So. I'm gonna support my theory on the on the stewardess, the flight attendant helping him on. And so you think he survived too? 
yeah, he might have survived. But the thing, what I'm saying, why I'm saying this, why I'm saying this, is because nobody else but the stewardess saw the suitcase. Nobody else saw it. It it was just them that said. So no one else saw the bomb except for exactly. So you think the first one, Schaffner, yeah, was in on it then, because only yeah. Schaffner saw the bomb, they, not not Buckalo, not Tina. Yeah, you you won't see in any any of these documentaries that both both of the of the flight attendants saw the bomb. Ah, you will see like only one, or maybe maybe what like maybe the two of them saw it, but I think he bribed them and or they were working together, and that's why he escaped the whole time. Okay, all right. Well, that, that's an interesting. Uh, theory uh yeah i mean because i didn't see some of you guys in the chat are asking me guys uh, i'll keep it a thousand with y'all i have no fucking clue like uh <laughs> um i i don't like to speculate on things wildly uh but given the the amount of time that he probably would have faced and the severity of the charges you know i air piracy is you're going to do a lot of time as you guys can see mccoy did like 40 plus years or something like that uh to him he looked at it like i'm not getting caught so the fact that he jumped out in a random area at night so cold um let's say he didn't land in the water and he landed in the in the woods well it would have been very difficult for him to you know navigate the woods that dark in the middle of nowhere with the wilderness yeah. without some type of aid and how would the aid know where he's at unless he had maybe a satellite phone on his person who knows maybe if he had um, camping gear with him. I mean, if you got a cigarette lighter uh, and a knife, I mean, you could build fire, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe he was an outdoorsman and he kind of was like, you know what, no matter where I land, I'll be able to survive and find my way back. So that could have been it as well. Um, he might I, not pay somebody to help him and we'll never know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll never know. I mean, uh, there's a high likelihood too that he was, he was Canadian, that he mm -hmm. could have, after he had the money, he would have went back right into Canada. Because as you guys know, uh, just so you guys know, and I didn't know this from being in, in Homeland for so long, uh, the northern border border is not nearly as secure as the southern border, right? You can kind of go up and down into, you know, into and out of Canada, no problem. If you're an American or Canadian citizen, they don't really give a shit. Mm -hmm. um, it's the southwest border that all the scrutiny is at, you know? So it's possible that he could have fled back to Canada if he was a Canadian uh, citizen. There is some evidence to show that he was a Canadian. He could potentially have been Canada, a Canadian. So um and he could have also been canadian military guys he might have not been even american military could have been a canadian military so back then you wouldn't have to show your passport at the airport no i don't even think he showed id that's the thing yep you didn't even show id that's why he was able to say dan yeah. cooper and they didn't have to verify that was definitely not his real name yeah of course i you think he, he actually saw the comic I think he was like probably a, yeah yeah a fan of the comic and he was like you oh, okay. yeah that's just too many that's way too coincidental yeah, yeah. so um, I have fifty three percent of people voting that yes, he survived. Okay. Thirty five percent no, and twelve percent that he was lucky the whole time. <laughs> okay, and people are saying TSA. Yeah, guys, TSA didn't exist back then. TSA came into play after the nine eleven attacks, guys. I don't think y'all understand how different the nineteen seventies were, man. A lot of you guys are young here in the chat, so you don't know. I mean, I was born in nineteen ninety, so I don't even know. But I'll tell y'all, even as a kid. I remember airports were not nearly as strict after 9-11. So the 70s were a whole different breed. No IDs. You plop $20 down. You buy the ticket right there at the counter. There's no internet to reserve the ticket beforehand. There's no Expedia. None of this bullshit. They had travel agents who you could call or you could just show up to the airport and just put the money down and pay and be on the plane and go to where you got to go. So there was no security. And they didn't give a shit. They served alcohol. They served uh, – you could you could smoke cigarettes back then on planes. It wasn't, a, you know, the, the security – that you guys have come to learn uh, as of today. So uh, let's read the rest of these chats and close this yeah. thing out. We got almost 1,400 of y'all back in here. Welcome back for all you guys that bailed when we hit the uh, <laughs> little stream unavailable thing. Uh, but we watchers. made it. Uh, Dollar, thank you so much from the Air Brother. Uh, who else? We got uh, John Ray, DB, A cool, them boys. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, you should never discount a suspect, suspect just because of witness uh, something they don't remember shit and that's from rob yeah that's true witnesses can be uh faulty at times darnell elliot goes mr Gaines. if cooper was prior military he would have known the difference between training and real parachutes the military always marks training aids as to not confuse with We're real right, items too. okay but again uh he didn't take he took it uh the dummy shoot probably to secure the money darnell mm -hmm. you got to remember that as well uh 
JR Troy, five bucks. Appreciate that, my friend. Uh, likes are literally free, unlike this super chat. Do this man some justice and show love for his and, and Helica's work. I appreciate that, my Helica. friend. And pronouncing it with the Spanish way. Uh, yeah, guys, we're, we're at 1.2K likes. If we can hit 1,300 likes before the end of the show, we're almost at 1,400 y'all watching, but I'm not going to ask for 1,400 likes. I'm just going to ask for 1.3 so we can have that high engagement. Um, Sam Swaka goes, Myron, I'll just tell you who D.B. Cooper was. I'm 30% them boys. We eat matzo ball <laughs> soup and running the world. Also accept my LinkedIn Connect Fresh too. Okay, I appreciate that, my friend. Uh, IRS, shout out to you, IRS. Uh, I paid y'all, man, so don't ask me no more questions. Shout out to you, Myron, for providing great content that no one else can match. Angie out here providing why some women actually deserve some things. W. Fedrax, yes, Angie is very, very helpful, guys. Uh, African goes, 10 bucks. Two years, I've been listening while at work. Never missed an episode. You guys at FNF changed my life. Thank you. Maybe someday I'll stop ninja watching L Anus and reach around and soy boy reactors. Yeah, fuck those idiots, man. I appreciate that, my friend. Oh my God, there you go. Down the Marco, Marco. Uh, anything else? That's it. We're caught up? Cool. Yeah. Uh, Angie, uh, what are your last thoughts on this case and what do you think? Um, yeah, well, I already said it. I think he might have survived. He might have paid somebody to help him. Or, I don't know, he probably died. But I, I don't think, I mean, if he died, could he have drowned the whole time? I don't know. That's the, those are my. I have so many questions. Yeah, if he landed the landed in the water, he definitely could have survived, but it would have been frigid. So he would have had. Unless, but we don't know if he had gear with him. Who knows if he, he had didn't gear? Have in his gear. I'm telling you, like he was wearing a suit and a coat. No, 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 I mean, as in, like maybe he wore long johns under his shit. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, but it depends on where he landed. Uh, Michael Mishrek, one dollar. Appreciate that. And uh, and I gave y'all my thoughts, man. So who knows? But regardless, the legend is gonna stay. Uh, Pre the, again, the only air hijacking to be unsolved in American history. Speaking of air hijackings, I'll probably cover uh, an air hijacking case hijacking. for you guys That'd from Declassified. Awesome. There was a good one um, that came out on Declassified uh, from, I think, the Egypt air hijacking in, of like the 90s or 80s. But, but yeah, hi hijacking is an L because most of the hijackings just get caught. Yeah, <laughs> you know? facts. It's, it's like a big L. Yeah, that okay. shit is a big, big fucking owl. We have air a, hijacking. A few super chats. Uh, Chief Keep goes. DB Cooper's Angie's grandpa escaped to her country. Okay, definitely a possibility. Yeah. Blink Dark Mellow goes. Myron is a boss, looking good, bro. Stay up. I appreciate that, my friend. I got my hair back. Um, uh, cool guys. I think we're at one point two k. Let's see. Did we hit one point three? One point two. Yeah. One point two. God damn it, y'all didn't. Y'all are acting like them boys right now. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of uh, Fed Reacts. Um, you guys have been asking for DB Cooper for a very long time. Yes. Uh, and yeah. I got you guys. Yes. Yeah, shout out to Angie for suggesting this episode for you guys. She actually brought it back to my memory because I have forgot about even doing this one. Uh, and we're, the next episode we'll probably do again, uh, we'll do something with the Mafia for y'all. And then we'll do something with Ryan Dawson. And then after that, I think we might take a one or two week break where we cover serial killers and other cases that you guys have been requesting for a while for the Thursday episodes. And then we will go ahead and get into the Colombian cartel. So that's probably going to be the next series that we do. And uh, please follow at Fed Reacts on Instagram, guys. Uh, we are almost at 1K followers, and yeah, uh, I'm very like excited and happy with the with the Instagram and how it's going because we have plenty of content coming up. Bam! And uh, Angie is running that as well. So uh, yeah. you do you take you take requests on there as well, right? Yes, I do. I do take requests. And she responds. And also, you guys been texting me to to ask Myron for works and this and that, and I'll be you know yeah uh, asking Myron about those things as well. Yeah, so shout out to Angie for managing the Fed Reacts on um, Instagram. Uh, it's linked below. And then also, guys, uh, the audio version of the podcast we have it live on Anchor, aka also known as uh, on Spotify for creators nowadays. I think is what it's called. So if you guys want to listen to the audio version of this podcast, it's definitely there. So, uh, you know, we're on Apple Podcasts. Uh, shout out to Mo for handling that, by the way. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, every single podcast platform that you guys like and enjoy. We're out there. Actually, I can show you all real quick um, what I mean by this. Um, it's right here. If you guys go to the description, right? Uh, let me show it to you all real fast. You go to the description, right? Uh, so we'll go on YouTube real quick. Right? We need to change that photo. Yeah, I need to change it. This is true. <laughs> but you go, you come here, right? So this is the video, right? I'm showing myself here. And then top of the description, Anchor, right? Fed Reacts, bam. It'll bring you there. And then you can go ahead and pick whatever platform you like, whether it's Apple, Spotify, or an RSS or whatever it is. But uh, let's say we go to Spotify. Bam, here we are. You know what I mean? Nice. Or if you guys like Apple, click this. Boom, we're on Apple. 
Okay. Nice. So yeah, man, all the episodes are there, guys. Go check it out. Uh, cause some of you guys like to get the audio version, but I know Spotify also has it on video as well. If you guys like video and yeah. Mo uploads, uh, I think, uh, once or twice a week. So, um, so yeah, man. Uh, can you show the playlist as well? Uh, oh, oh, oh yeah. On the channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah good idea. Actually. So guys, if you come on over to the YouTube channel, right. For fed reacts, you guys are going to see here, uh, the nice little banner. Um, and then, Oh, what the hell? My bad. I did not mean that. Uh, <laughs> you come down. And let me hit control plus a few so they can actually see. Right. Uh, you guys, so we have different playlists for y'all, right? We got um, all videos, right? So every single video that we release is right here, right? In chronological order from uh, newest to oldest. Then you go into the hip hop and Rico cases, right? Um, from the most viewed, right? We got the YSL, O Block, Melly, Casanova. Because a lot of you guys have asked for some of these cases. We've already done them, right? The um, yeah. Obviously, the Black Mafia, Tory Lanez. Uh, six nine. Um, then we go into infamous serial killers: Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killer, the Night nice Stalker, um, Golden State Killer. I had a lot of fun doing this one with Kim and um, um, Angie. The Toy Box Killer, BTK, uh, Samuel Little actually has the most kills in history. The Green River Killer. Uh, then we got high profile cases. You know, Amber Heard. Um, <laughs> this one was crazy. Um, um, Courtney Clenny, Hush Puppy, Nigerian yeah. Scammer, Jeffrey Epstein. Um, Shanquella Robinson, uh, Vibes Cartel, the Nashville shooter, Jody Arias. Oh, yeah, this chick is fucking crazy. crazy. Casey Anthony. That's one of my favorite ones. And then we go into national security cases, guys. We got terrorism, right? We got the Merchant of Death, Victor Bout, Osama bin Laden, 9 11, right? We cover it the official narrative and the conspiracy. The, uh, the DC snipers, right? I did this one with Angie as well. This was very enjoyable. The Boston Marathon bombing, right? We actually just had the 10 year anniversary for the Boston Marathon bombing. Wow. Uh, so, and I go into detail on this one as well, man. It's three, because uh, I was living in Boston at the time. So I go like, look, look how in depth we go on some of these fucking things. I'm showing surveillance footage of when that Asian guy ran away from the hijackers and made the phone call. I played the 911 call. All the detailed stamps are in there for y'all. You know, so go ahead and watch some of this stuff, man. We put a lot of work in there. Um, we cover the Unabomber, uh, espionage cases, right? We got Hezbollah. Queen Anna, uh, Anna Montez, right? She was spying for Fidel Castro back in the That's day. That's very good one, yeah. Organized crime cases, right? We got the real paid and full story. This one was the craziest dirty cop history show ever with the um, Operation Shattered Shield. Pablo Escobar, uh, which was a ring in New York that he got caught, but we're going to cover it in more detail. We got the Italian Mafia in here. The biggest heist in history, 18.9 million, right? The Pizza Bomber case, which I did that with Angie. Whitey Bulger. Y'all been asking me for Whitey Bulger forever. I have it. It's right here, God damn it. Okay? Whitey Bulger. It's here. All right? One of the biggest, uh, one of the most infamous uh, mobsters in Boston history. Right? Uh, which I go, I suggest you guys go watch Black Mass. Right? Great movie. Yeah, Myron has like 300 plus videos in this channel, guys. I suggest you to check you all, to check them all before you request another one. Because you'll be requesting like the same ones over and over. And some of them We've Myron done. had already covered. So and then yeah. I got a whole playlist just on the Italian Mafia. I went ahead and covered the Colombo crime family with Michael Francis. Yeah, Francis. shout out to him. Right? Uh, Man, I was we dying did, that day. And then we did uh, the Bonanno crime family, Genovese, Gambino. Yeah. All, you know, history of the Italian Mafia. So, guys, we got probably the most diverse Content. true crime channel on fucking YouTube, man. Yep. So, subscribe to the channel, man. Let's get to 200K on the way. Like this goddamn video. Let's hit 1,300 likes. And uh, yeah, man, we're the best, man. We're the best out here. <laughs> yeah. So um, cool. Other than that, guys, we'll catch you guys on the next episode of Fed. I'm going to go ahead and play this. Uh, this is the second to last um, demo of the intro slash outro. Um, like the video, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Love y'all. Angie, I'll give you the last word before I close this thing out. That was it. I already did it like two times. Okay, fantastic. Bye, Stupid. guys. See you Bye, next guys. Time. Later. <laughs> I'm a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. Friend of Jeffrey Williams and associate of YSL did commit the felony. Oh, here's what 6 9 actually got. Racketeer conspiracy. This attack shifted the whole U.S. government. This guy got arrested. Espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russians. Zodiac Killer is a pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who operated in Northern California. All these serial killers got um, Samuel Little, etc. They really get off on getting attention from the media. Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploited and abused dozens of minor girls. It was OJ working together to get... Nicole K.